It's almost time. Yes. So, Srilekha, we are live. Uh, we will, you may start now. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the KCIPM slide seminar, February 2022, uh, brought to you by KC, KCIPM social media and uh, Anand Newberg uh, Reference Laboratory. I am Dr. Srilika, a member of social media subcommittee of KCIPM. I welcome Dr. Aditya Agnihotri, Secretary KCIPM, Dr. Jairam N. Iyengar, Managing Director of the Newberg uh, Anand Reference Laboratories, and faculty for the session, Dr. Anand Vikas, Dr. Rakshit, Dr. Glenn Sheldon and Dr. Swati. For, uh, for the housekeeping notes, uh, before we get started, we request all the audience to set the resolution at 720 uh, pixels for a clearer video, uh, requesting the audience to participate activity, actively throughout the live chats. There will be a spotter after each case, so please be ready to respond uh, quickly and in the chat box. Kindly subscribe to the channels, uh, uh, KCIPM SOBI YouTube channel, so let's get started and I welcome all the faculty to start the proceedings. All the best to the uh, postgraduates who are presenting. Uh, handing over to Dr. Uh, Vikas. Thank you, Dr. Srileka. Uh, before we start off with discussing the cases, uh, am I audible? Sorry. Okay. Yeah, before we start off with discussing the cases, I just like to uh, tell you all that we had shared the cases on 18th of February and we've received a good number of responses. So thank you all for that. Uh, as I can see, about four consultants, 25 postgraduates sent in their responses. What was good that even two colleges sent in their consensus responses, that was nice for us to see. Um, we'll be presenting the analysis of each case as we discuss the individual cases. So for the first five cases, I would like to hand over to Dr. Rakshit to coordinate, uh, and then I'll be back for the hematology cases. Dr. Rakshit. So, uh, good afternoon, yeah. everyone. Uh, first off, we'll be have a discussion from the histopathology department, uh, starting with the case number one. It's from Kim's Hubali. Uh, Dr. Anjali Balu will be presenting. Sir, am I audible, sir? Uh, yes, you're audible. Yeah, I'll share my screen right now. Okay. Are you able to see, sir? It's still coming up. Share again. Are you able to see now, sir? Yes, could you put it full screen, please? Yes, this is fine. Go ahead, please. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, all. I'm Dr. Anjali from Kim Subli. I'll be briefing on case number one. So let's see the history. It's a 50-year-old female uh, swelling in the left eye, and for that, she have underwent lacrimal gland biopsy. So this is the microscopical picture where you can see the whole mound view. There are three tissue bits, which uh, we'll be seeing all the three tissue bits on higher magnification. Here, as you can see, the first tissue bit, you can see the structure of the lacrimal gland. And in that, you can see they're arranged in lobules separated by fibrovascular septa. In the next image, you can see the ducts, acini, and the stroma. So when we are looking onto the ducts and acini, you can see the ducts where the basophilic basally located nucleus and eosinophilic granular cytoplasm. And you can see the ducts also but here you can actually appreciate a good amount of duct proliferation. Now going on to the stroma and all these ducts and acine are looking normal and going on to the stroma in this image itself, you can see there are, there are many basophilic areas. So on higher magnification, those basophilic areas are lymphoplasmacytic infiltrates and these infiltrates are actually destroying a part of acine and ducts. And in the next image, you can see the geminal center so you can see there are plenty of plasma cells along with lymphocytic infiltrate. 
Now, uh, nearby vessels, you can see there are hyalinized uh, blood vessels showing thrombus. Now, going on to the second uh, tissue bit, you can see that it is the fibromuscular, the skeletal muscle fragment. In this view itself, you can appreciate there are dense inflammatory infiltrates in the stroma as well as in the uh, in between the uh, muscle fibers. On the next magnification, you can appreciate the endomysial inflammation consisting of lymphoplasma sites. And in the next image, in these muscle fibers, you can actually see a non rim vacuole. It is actually a non-specific finding. So this non rim vacuole, along with this endomysial inflammation, is suggestive of polymyositis. So in this next image, you can see there is perineural inflammation of lymphoplasma cytic infiltrate. Along with uh, the stroma, you can see there is some kind of eosinophilic deposition. This is the next uh, tissue bit. There is fibrocollagenous tissue bit you can see there also dense inflammatory infiltrate you can see in the next image also see you can appreciate there is a, a inflammatory infiltrate surrounding the vascular tissue there is perivascular inflammation now summarizing all the points if we are seeing the positive findings we can see that the lacrimal tissue uh, structure the architecture is maintained throughout and the ducts in asina is most of the time uh, more in more likely it is looking normal and but the only thing is that the stroma is showing dense lymphoplasma cytic infiltrate along in the endomysium in the stroma uh, the perivascular perineural there is dense lymphoplasma cytic infiltrate so uh, it is definitely a dacroadenitis so the approach to dacroadenitis either it can be inflammatory or it can be neoplastic so inflammatory if you are looking onto the causes of inflammatory it can be infectious or non-infectious infectious it can be bacterial or viral and these bacterial and viral both of this infectious etiology most of the time there will be a mixed inflammatory infiltrate in the histopathological section most uh, most commonly composed of neutrophils so we can think of only non-infectious uh, etiology in that under comes the autoimmune etiology is the most common in the lacrimal glands so that's all uh, that's about the inflammatory causes now coming on to the neoplastic causes it can be either epithelial or non-epithelial so epithelial definitely there is no epithelial atp so it can be a non-epithelial under that comes the lymphoma now saying about autoimmune there are many autoimmune disorders that affect the lacrimal gland that can be a Jogren's, IgG4 related scleroderma SLE, rheumatoid arthritis scler uh, etc so for uh, sar and also sarcoidosis so uh, when we are seeing sarcoidosis and all there should be a granuloma formation sle there should be many other clinical criteria like a clinical and immunological criteria to tell it as an sle and scleroderma there should be dense inflammation in the uh, dense fibrosis in between the periductal and perivascular so we can shorten it down into after ruling it out okay. you can put it into jogren syndrome and igg4 related disease so now let's see uh, each of the features in jogren syndrome age is between 40 to 50 years and igg4 related disease it is middle age and older age uh, sex predilection jogren's is more uh, female uh, predilection is there igg4 male predilection Seeing the histology, you can see periductal, perivascular infiltration by lymphocytes, lymphoid follicles with germinal center and ductal hyperplasia. In IgG4 related disease, there will be an infiltrate composing mainly of plasma cells and lymphocytes. IgG related disease, it's actually a constellation of diseases consisting of uh, inflammatory pseudotumor of orbit and then Mikulik syndrome. So when we are uh, seeing in our case, it was a 50 year old female and periductal and perivascular infiltration by lymphocytes are there. So uh, most likely I would like to give a provisional diagnosis of chronic dacroadenitis with, uh, with associated autoimmune etiology, possibly Jogren syndrome. But uh, there is in this tissue bit, actually, you can see few of germinal center in this section. But and in one among the germinal center, you can see a little bit of marginal zone proliferation that suggests that it can be a, a chronic inflammatory process going into lymphoma. But uh, uh, seeing all of the criteria like vasculitis, polymyositis and uh, periductal infiltration by lymphocytes and plasma cells, I would like to give a, a 
provisional diagnosis of chronic dacryoadenitis with associated autoimmune etiology, possibly Jogren syndrome. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Anjali, for that wonderful uh, presentation. Uh, now we have Dr. Shruti uh, who will be presenting from our side. Start video. Start video. Yeah. Are you able to see our screen? Yes, yes, we can. Please yes, go ahead. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Dr. Shruti. Thank you, Dr. Anjali. Uh, we'll see a little bit in detail about uh, case one. Uh, we received a tissue with history of 50 year old uh, female with swelling in the left eye. We had done a lacrimal gland biopsy. Oh. All done. Yes, What's the issue? Just click right click on the slide. Yeah, the we slide. got it. We got it. We have three tissue bits uh, of uh, lacrimal gland biopsy where the lacrimal is surrounded in the stroma by dense diffuse lymphoplasmacytic inflammatory input. Uh, just a second, we are still. We can't see the morphine. We can't see the morphine. That's a please share only the screen. Uh, I think you shared the application. That's right. Stop sharing and share the entire screen, Dr. Rakshad. Yeah. Able to see now? Just a second, nothing yet. Once you click on share button, you'll get the screen one or share entire screen. Stop video. Yes. yes, now we can. Yes, thank you. In this tissue fragment, uh, we can see the lacrimal gland tissue surrounded by dense lymphoplasmacytic inflammatory infiltrate, among which there is predominance of plasma cells. We can see here, if you zoom it, it will be predominance of sheets of plasma cells, what we are seeing. And the each lobule is surrounded by storiform fibrosis. There is a lot of fibrosis, which is around the lobules also and around the cells also. And one more feature, if you see closely into the, closely at the periphery of the tissue, there are many blood vessels, which are surrounded by inflammatory infiltrate, among which also the predominance is of plasma cells. These are the blood vessels which are surrounded by inflammatory cells. And still in the periphery, there are some obliterated blood vessels. Obliterated blood vessels. This is a this, this feature is called as obliterative phlebitis. Compiling all these features, one is uh, the lymphoplasmacytic inflammatory infiltrate, among which the predominance of plasma cells and obliterative phlebitis and the storiform fibrosis. Uh, we got responses uh, from uh, many of them. That is granulocytic sarcoma. Come up, Dr. Shruti. Uh, Dr. Rakshit, I don't think you've shared the entire screen. That's why it's happening. Share the entire screen so that you can toggle between your PowerPoint and uh, web. Now you can see. Yes. Yes. Granulocytic sarcoma, lymphoma, reactive lymphoid hyperplasia, acinic cell carcinoma, mucoepidermal carcinoma, chronic dacroadenitis, 
Jogren syndrome, Michelix disease, and IgG4 class of disease Jogren syndrome. These are all. Uh, these are the responses we receive. Uh, these are the uh, microscopic features which I already showed. These are the three important key features which we had to observe in the tissue. With all these features, we came to a provisional diagnosis of IgG4 related disease. So, in, uh, what are the investigations or the criteria which are required for the IgG4 related disease? One is clinical criteria. It should be diffuse or localized swelling or a mass which was there in a, in a, a case. And biochemical investigations, uh, the elevated serum IgG4 levels, it should be more than 135 milligram per deciliter. In our case, it was 376 milligram per deciliter. Uh, histopathological features, which I already told the three important features and uh, the immunohistochemical features one is igg4 positive cells it should be more than 10 in more than 10 per hyper field if we count 5 hyper field and in the small biopsies and more than 30 per hyper field in the larger tissues and uh, the ratio of igg4 and igg should be more than 40% so if 1 2 3 all the features are there then it will be the, the diagnosis will be definite of igg4 related disease 1 and 3 we can report it as pro probable or uh, 1 and 2 is there then we can report it as possible in our case all three features were there this is a uh, ihc image IgG positive cells were 128 per hyper field on an average of 5 fields and IgG4 positive cells were uh, 68 per hyper field and ratio we got was 53.2 which is clearly more than 40 percent. Uh, IgG4 related disease is an immune mediated multi-system disorder which is discovered recently in 2003 in Japan. It mimics autoimmune conditions, infection or malignancy. So and almost all the organs can be involved with this. Uh, especially the Michelix syndrome, Kutner's, Kutner's tumor, Riedel's thyroiditis, autoimmune pancreatitis and retroperitoneal fibrosis for which the pathogenesis was unclear are uh, classified under this category now. The pathogenesis for uh, IgG4 to ele uh, elevated levels of IgG4, three important features are uh, it is a non-inflammatory immunoglobulin. Antigen capture of undefined antigen is a function of this immunoglobulin and it uh, the inability of this immunoglobulin to form immune complexes. So there is no complement activation with this. Uh, either an antigen or autoimmune uh, condition will cause activation of T helper cells or T regulatory cells, which leads to increase in uh, inter uh, multiple cytokines. Interleukin 5 will lead to increase in eosinophils. So in the biopsies, we could see many eosinophils also. There will be transforming growth factor uh, activation, which leads to fibroblast activation. So there is fibrosis in this case. And these two interleukins, interleukin 4 and 10 are very important, which leads to IgG4 class switch. So there is B cell activation, plasma blast activation and plasma cell differentiation. Uh, immunoglobulin G1234, all are increased, but 1 to 3 will form an immune complex. So only IgG4 will be elevated in the serum. Uh, prognosis of this, it, uh, it causes in the inflammation and deposition of connective tissue. This may lead to either organ dysfunction, failure or death if untreated. It is a relapsing and remitting uh, mass forming disease, so the treatment do, will go on for longer time. Treatment, first line of treatment is uh, corticosteroids. If the patients are unresponsive, then it will lead to, uh, then the second line of treatment will be monoclonal antibody. There are many recent advances in this disease. It is an upcoming one. Uh, these are my references. Thank you. Okay, thank you Dr. Shruti for that presentation. Uh, we are open for any questions regarding the case. If not, we will follow with the first potter. Okay, so we'll go with the spotter. Uh, spotter number one, this is uh, from a 48 year old lady, uh, left breast lump. What is your diagnosis? You can type your comments into the comment uh, section. 30 seconds. Okay. 
presenting can actually use the Webex chat box itself to send in your responses. Okay, one uh, one doctor says mucin is carcinoma. Uh, there's one uh, with lobular carcinoma. Dr. Lakshmi Ronanda says lobular carcinoma. Dr. Akalia says ductal carcinoma of the breast. Identify the cells. What kind of cells? Plasma cytoid. Okay, so we are done with 30 seconds. Okay, so here we are seeing cells with predominant plasma cytoid morphology. DD is being, you know, lobular versus a plasma cytoma. Uh, we had an IC done with CD138, which was diffusely positive, followed by Kappa and Lambda, which showed Kappa restriction. So the final diagnosis was a plasma cell neoplasm with Kappa light chain restriction of the breast. Okay, now we'll go ahead for case number two. If the, uh, case number two uh, will be from uh, Dr. Amanda Lobo uh, from Father Muller Medical College, Mangalore. Over to Dr. Amanda now. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, am I audible? Uh, yes, my mother. Thank you. Is my screen visible? Yes, yes, it's visible. Please go ahead. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. This is Dr. Amanda from Father Muller Medical College presenting case two of the slide seminar organized by KCIAPM. And it is my privilege to be here. So coming to the clinical details of case number two, it was a 27 year old male with complaints of persistent headache, arthria and ataxia since a month, uh, following which she had blurred vision and episodes of vomiting for seven days. The CT findings were that of hydrocephalus and a well-defined intraaxial hypodense space occupying lesion in the left cerebellar hemisphere measuring 49.2 into 65.8 into 33.1 millimeter. So coming to the microphotograph images of the same, here we can see on scan of view, uh, cerebellar tissue bits characterized by the outer molecular layer and the inner granular layer. Again, a scan of view of the images. What we notice as we come on higher power is that there seems to be an abnormal, a few abnormal areas showing both the glial component as well as the neuronal component in varying proportions, which we will see in further slides. Again, here we are able to appreciate uh, the neuronal component as well as the glial component, which seems to have a very fibrillary matrix. Concentrating on the neuronal component, first we have the dysplastic neuronal cells, which are arranged very haphazardly in clusters. And individually, these are cells which are large with eccentric nucleus and washed out pale eosinophilic cytoplasm. Another image explaining and showing the same features as described above. What we also notice amongst the fibrillary matrix is the presence of uh, these bodies devoid of nucleus and containing eosinophilic uh, material, which looks granular, the, namely the eosinophilic granular bodies present within the glial component. Again, on a lower power, we're able to appreciate that very brightly at this field. What we also notice is the glial component, which has prominent microcystic spaces in the, uh, in the fibrillary matrix that we can appreciate here. We can see both the neuronal component as well as the glial component, which can be in varying proportions. The presence of a few scattered binucleated forms are also seen. So with all the descriptions given below and uh, given above, as well as with the clinical details that we had and uh, the histological and radiological findings, uh, these were my findings on histology. There was a tumor con comprising of both the ganglional and the glial neoplastic component with the ga dysplastic ganglion cells in clusters adjacent to neoplastic glial areas containing eosinophilic granular bodies in a fibrillary matrix having microcystic spaces. And my provisional impression was that of a glioneuronal tumor with a morphology favoring ganglioglioma. The differentials that could be considered are the following. Uh, considering if there was no uh, glial component present, uh, we and only glial uh, and only neoplastic, uh, only ganglion, uh, ganglional cells present, we would give a diagnosis of gangliocytoma. Lermet-Duclos disease is basically 
Uh, dysplastic cerebellar gangliocytoma, which could also be a good differential considering. However, the uh, dysplastic ganglion cells are limited to the internal granular layer of the cerebellar and they do not as such distort the cerebellar architecture. They just thicken the cerebellar folia and uh, uh, don't cause any obliteration. So, uh, this is how I would like to end. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Amanda, for the presentation. Uh, now we have Dr. Pooja from uh, from ADN presenting the case. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so we have the case here. According to the history, it's all suggestive of cerebellar signs with signs of raised intracranial tension. The CT scan showed dilation of both the lateral and third ventricles with a mass in the cerebellum causing obliteration of the fourth ventricle. All these features were suggestive of hydrocephalus. Another CT scan image showing a well-defined intraaxial hypodense space occupying lesion in the left cerebellar hemisphere causing compression and obliteration of the fourth ventricle. Going on to the case. So as rightly pointed out, we are seeing normal cerebellar tissue fragments here showing the molecular layer, the Purkinje cells here and the internal granular cell layer. Okay. Going on to the other fragments. Here again, the molecular layer is preserved. Somewhere here we are seeing that the granular layer is starting to get a little observed, not normal. And your another feature which we are seeing is the absence of the Purkinje cell layer. Now we would like to see what is happening exactly to the granule cell layer. As rightly pointed out, it is being replaced by these kind of dysplastic looking ganglion cells with cent central to eccentric nuclei and abundant eosinophilic to pale cytoplasm. Here we can see clearly at the low power that the molecular layer is quite preserved and the internal granule layer is completely replaced by these kind of dysplastic cells. Okay. Thus, ganglion cells here show abundant eosinophilic to pale cytoplasm. The nuclei are looking, uh, showing some prominent nucleoli but otherwise are normal. The Purkinje cell layer is classically absent here. Let's see what responses have we got. So, uh, as by, said by the presenter, she called it as a case of ganglioglioma. Other differentials, most commonly what we received was pilocytic astrocytoma, cytopathic effect of CMV or HSV. So, basically there was no glial component which was neoplastic. It was all reactive. For a pilocytic astrocytoma or a ganglioglioma, the glioma component should mainly show bipolar cells. There should be a biphasic pattern there and uh, the bipolar cells sh should be present in a fibrillary cytoplasm. The eosinophilic granular bodies are a component of the reactive component because something is happening in the internal granular layer. The molecular layer is giving a reaction which is leading to the formation of eosinophilic granular bodies. We didn't see any rosanthal fibers which are seen in gliomas. 
and in cytopathic effect of CMV or HSV, we should see intranuclear intense basophilic cyto uh, in inclusions, powdery bodies as they are called, and they should be surrounded by a halo. And uh, again, uh, the cytoplasm should show granules. Hence, the diagnosis in this case was of dysplastic cerebellar gangliocytoma or Lermite Duclos disease. A small discussion regarding the same disease. About 200 cases are reported in the literature. It's a rare entity and it commonly presents in the third to fourth decade. Now, this uh, disease is mainly a manifestation of the Corden syndrome. So, it is important to diagnose this as we need to monitor these patients for development of other neoplasms as a part of Corden syndrome, which can be tri either trichelomomas, other amatomas, and most commonly breast cancers and thyroid cancers in females. So, the pathogenesis of Lermite Duclos disease goes as the primary cell of origin, as we saw, is the cerebellar granule neuron, and there is aberrant migration and hypertrophy of this granule cells. Why is this caused? It is because of the PK, P10 AKT pathway, which is a major regulator of cell growth, which leads to secondary activation of mammalian target of rapamycin mTOR, and this leads to the granule cell hypertrophy, which we just saw in LDD. IHC supports the same where synaptophysin is intensely positive in these cells and these cells characteristically show loss of P10 protein expression. The prognosis of this case is lies such that it, it can recur locally, but it does not spread to other structures. If we can identify a inhibitor related to this mTOR protein, it can uh, lead to uh, like the recurrence can also be controlled. So basically, what is this? Whether it is neoplastic or hamartomous lesion, it's a controversy. But whatever it is, if it is neoplastic, it corresponds to WHO grade 1 since it just recurs and does not spread. These were my references. Thank you for your attention and thank you for the presenter to include this as a differential. Thank you, Dr. Pooja, for the presentation. So any question, we're open to take it. So we we'll move on to the uh, second spot up. Okay, so this is uh, from a 38 year old male uh, with history of recurrent abdominal discomfort. Biopsy is from the duodenum. Okay, identify the predominant infiltrate. In the organism, 30 seconds. So, we've not got any responses till now. We can open for another 10 seconds. Okay. So, uh, uh, it was uh, the case of eosinophilic duodenitis, secondary to strong doses invasive. Thank you. I will go on to case number three uh, from MVJ Medical College, Hoskote, uh, by Dr. Akhalya Mani Maran. Over to Dr. Akhalya. I'm Dr. Akhalya Manimaran uh, from MVJ Medical College. I'm going to present case three. The case history given was 68 year old gentleman with swelling in front of the neck and the ultrasound showed thyroid spot and total thyroidectomy was done. So there were seven sections which were given and these are the scanner view of the sections that given. So seven sections are there. These are the first four sections and these are the next three sections. So section one, five and six was taken from the left lobe of thyroid and sections two, three and four was taken from the right lobe of thyroid. Section seven was taken from the isthmus. So this is the section one in which uh, in right side,
right side there is normal thyroid tissue containing follicles of uh, thyroid with uh, colloid is present and in left side there is presence of tumor tissue which is arranged in papillary pattern and here the arrangement of papillary pattern with fibrovascular core is present in an enlarged view here there is tumor cells arranged in papillary pattern with fibrovascular core and optically clear nucleus with nuclear crowding is also present so here is the optically clear nucleus with optically clear nucleus is present with eosinophilic cytoplasm so nuclear grooves are also present and uh, intranuclear inclusions are present with few areas of calcification is also present so section 5 shows uh, tumor cells arranged in papillary pattern with few areas of necrosis and section 6 shows uh, tumor cells arranged in sclerotic stroma so next we will go to the right lobe of the thyroid in which section 2 is from the right lobe which consists uh, of normal thyroid tissue in the right side and um, there is a capsule with underlying tumor tissue this uh, this is a tumor tissue which consists of tumor cells arranged in microfollicular arrangement with a hyperchromatic nucleus so in section 3 we can see a capsule with underlying tumor tissue and beyond the capsule there is a tumor again which shows capsular invasion this is the enlarged view of the capsular invasion which consists of tumor cells and here is from section 3 again we can see the vessels which is lined by epithelioid cells is infiltrated by the tumor tissue here it is a enlarged view of the vascular invasion in section 4 again we can see the capsular invasion and we can see the vascular invasion is also noted and in section 7 which is the isthmus we can see only the normal thyroid tissue which consists of varying size follicles Uh, consisting of colloid so so to summarize section 1 5 and 6 which is taken from the left lobe of thyroid section study shows papillary pattern with a fibrovascular core and optically clear nucleus is present with nuclear grooving and nuclear pseudo inclusions also noted are areas of necrosis in a sclerotic stroma so next is section 2 3 and 4 which is taken from the right lobe of thyroid the section study shows encapsulated tumor tissue consisting of microfollicular arrangement of tumor cells with round to oval hyperchromatic nucleus and both vascular and capsular invasion is noted so the provisional diagnosis is synchronous papillary thyroid carcinoma and follicular carcinoma thank you Thank you, Dr. Akalya, for the wonderful presentation. Now we'll uh, have Dr. Narish uh, presenting the case. So good afternoon, everyone. So good afternoon, everyone. So nice presentation by Akalya. Uh, so this is a 68-year-old male with swelling in front of neck. USG showed a thyroid four. Okay, so so uh, total thyroidectomy was performed. So this is an unfixed gross specimen. Uh, on fixation, we can see external surface, both lobes nodular. Cut section, we can see uh, right, uh, right lobe with a pinkish, uh, well circumscribed pinkish uh, lobe, and while uh, left lobe ill circumscribed, grayish white in appearance. So here we can see a right lobe well circumscribed with a uh, Hemorrhagic areas, while uh, left uh, ill circumscribed, grey white areas, kind of fibromatosis uh, look we can uh, think or a, a fibrous look. So coming to the case, so this is the uh, section taken from the left lobe as we can see on lobe or it is a partly uh, circumscribed and uh, at 
uh, places we can see normal thyroid area parenchyma and at places we can see papillary con uh, papillary areas multifocal areas with a papillary configuration with the characteristic papillary thyroid carcinoma nuclear features like orphanine nuclei what important in this what uh, presenter missed is a uh, stroma this is a more of fibrous stroma kind of desmoid like appearance or desmoid like uh, uh, pattern normally we don't see a papillary carcinoma thyroid with such kind of stroma so it's a variant of papillary carcinoma thyroid on this section okay so coming to the right lobe we can see well circumscribed nodule okay the capsule is thick fibrous capsule uh, and the microscopy more predominantly we can see microfollicular patterns as rightly said by presenter microfollicular pa patterns but what she missed is areas of infarction areas of infarction yes here we can see areas of infarction and at places cells are arranged in an insular pattern or a solid uh, pattern so while considering this we can think of turing consensus uh, criteria in that for a, 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 a insular carcinoma that is poorly differentiated carcinoma in that we we see a solid or a, a trabecular or an insular pattern along with absence of papillary nuclear features uh, in the follicular cells along with that areas of necrosis and mitotic activity more than 3 per 10 high power field while in follicular carcinoma we see less than 3 uh, per 10 hypophyll mitotic activity. So this is the these are the distinguishing, uh, distinguishing points. More important, one more thing to call follicular carcinoma. Here is the capsular as well as vascular invasion. We can see capsular nice uh, capsular invasion, and here we can see vascular invasion. So it's a follicular carcinoma with uh, synchronous this uh, insular carcinoma in same lobe. So here, here are the various responses we got. Papillary carcinoma thyroid, yes, it was in the left lobe, but right lobe, it was a follicular carcinoma with insular uh, carcinoma along with that. So uh, again, other response was follicular variant of papillary carcinoma. No follicular carcinoma, there was no any nuclear uh, parathyro uh, uh, papillary thyroid carcinoma nuclear features. Okay. So so uh, as i said touring consensus classification like uh, like this we can uh, you can read from the who classification book it's uh, nicely given there so here you can see a follicular patterns micro follicular pattern but no nuclear uh, characteristic papillary car uh, carcinoma thyroid nuclear features right okay then here we can see capsular as well as vascular invasion this is the transformation area uh, from follicular carcinoma to the insular or a poorly differentiated carcinoma okay these are the uh, characteristic of uh, this left lobe. This is taken from left lobe showing para papillary carcinoma thyroid with the somatomatous calcifications. And at places, we can see a squamoid differentiation as well. So here is the stroma, characteristic desmoid-like pattern or fibromatosis-like pattern. Earlier, it was called nodular fasciitis uh, variant, but now it was called, uh, it is called as a desmoid variant of papillary carcinoma thyroid. So final diagnosis was a synchronous mixed thyroid malignancy right lobe showing widely invasive follicular carcinoma with the poorly differentiated carcinoma insular carcinoma left lobe showing papillary carcinoma thyroid with fibromatosis or of fasciitis uh, fasciitis like stroma variant so this coming to the discussion we can see these are the various uh, papillary important carcinomas well differentiated carcinomas this is the poorly differentiated carcinoma these are the distinguishing points uh, different variations so mutations uh, you can see braf mutation common in papillary carcinoma and our andras mutation common in follicular while both uh, you see in the insula carcinoma important point is uh, here uh during consensus so this is the article uh, these are the two articles we see in uh, uh showing uh mixed medullary and follicular carcinoma so mixed thyroid malignancies have been reported rarely, most common being a papillary and medullary carcinoma with red proto-oncogene followed by papillary and follicular. This presentation, presentation of to poorly differentiated form, a special subtype of papillary carcinoma thyroid in same gland with the and same patient has never been documented. That too, this uh, desmoid-like variant uh, of papillary carcinoma thyroid. Okay. 
Okay, so these are the different articles we see uh, synchronous papillary follicular thyroid carcinoma, but never uh, with this uh, fibromatosis uh, like uh, or a desmoid like uh, pattern in papillary. So this is one article we can see a papillary thyroid carcinoma with des desmoid like fibromatosis, but not in the like uh, there was no any synchronous um, uh, malignancy in the same patient. So these are the various uh, genetic alterations we can see, and these are the various IHC markers if at all you want to uh, put. So, and in French Canadian pathologist Pierce Mason rightly said, no classification is more difficult to establish than thyroid malignancies or carcinomas. So, these are my references. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Naresh, for that wonderful presentation. Uh, just a small question to ask is, uh, the spindle cell proliferation, what you're seeing, is it a neoplastic process or is it a non-neoplastic reaction, what you're seeing? Uh, can put your comments down. So uh, most often it is they say that it is a non-neoplastic proliferation to the tumor cells. Okay. So now we move on uh, for the third spotter. Spotter was presented by Dr. Priya. So this is spotter number three. This is a 29-year-old female uh, liver biopsy, which was sent to us. It's a hyperpigmented liver and uh, with a history of congenital hyperbilirubinemia. Uh, your diagnosis based on the cross findings. This is the microscopic picture of the same liver biopsy. This should help you to uh, come to a guess a diagnosis. Uh, there's a response from Dr. Alekia Reddy's Jubil Johnson. Uh, we request participants to actively give your comments in the uh, chat section. You have 10 seconds more. Uh, one, uh, uh, we have Dubin Johnson syndrome again, neonatal hepatitis, and again Dubin Johnson. Okay, so we'll close the comment section. So that was a good diagnosis. It is indeed a case of Dubin Johnson syndrome, uh, showing uh, this uh, uh, pigment in the uh, pericalinicular and uh, lobular uh, pigment, which uh, confirms the diagnosis. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, now we move on to case number four. Uh, uh, being presented by Dr. Lakshmi Kant D from SNMC College, Bagalkot. Over to you, uh, Dr. Lakshmi. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, am I audible, sir? Yes, Dr. Lakshmi Kant, please go ahead. Yes. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so I, I like to thank everyone for the opportunity given. So the case number four, the history given was 50 year, two year old lady with right nasal cavity mass, bilateral fiber optic endoscopic sinus surgery done. So this is the first section uh, in under the low power view. Uh, and uh, here, here uh, in the again in the low power view, we can see an endophytic growth. And uh, here again, we are able to appreciate uh, uh, the endophytic growth. And uh, here we are seeing that the tissue is lined uh, by a ciliated pseudostratified columnar epithelium. And again, here we are, we are able to appreciate the same lining. And uh, here we are seeing the nest of squamous cells, which are uh, showing an endophytic growth and uh, with a minimal uh, fibrostroma. And here we are able to see areas of hemorrhage with an inflammatory cell infiltrates. And uh, this is the second section. Uh, here again, we are able to see the an endophytic growth with uh, plenty of areas of fibrosis. And uh, here again, we are able to appreciate the nests of squamous cells. And uh, he, uh, he, again, uh, we can able to see the individual squamous cells are here mildly pleomorphic and with an hyperchromatic nucleus. So here again in the in, in stroma, we are able to see uh, congested blood vessels with uh, chronic inflammatory cell infiltrates. 
and uh, so the final diagnosis that i would like to uh, give is uh, it is an inverted schneiderian papillom so small point in discussion on a uh, inverted schneiderian papilloma so the name schneiderian papillom mucosa comes from the uh, in, uh, in a, the origin of the endoderm endoderm rather than the uh, ectodermal sorry it uh, due to the origin of ectoderm rather than endodermal origin so the uh, schneiderian papilloma are of three varieties one is exo exophytic endophytic and oncocytic so the most common causes for the cyanonasal or the schneiderian papilloma are uh, human papilloma virus most common being uh, 6 and 11 so uh, here the inverted uh, uh, lesion has the here the, there is an inverted endophytic growth which is inver uh, invaginate into the edematostoma and it is most commonly involves the lateral lasal wall and the sinuses so the treatment is a complete surgical excision and there are no reliable indicators for the recurrence but uh, recurrence most commonly seen in patients with inadequate surgical excision uh, so malignant transformations are reported uh, which are very less uh, 12 to 20 percentage and it is more common with the uh, oncocytic variant so thank you for the opportunity uh, thank you dr lakshmi khan for the uh, presentation now we move on uh, for for the presentation by dr bhavna Good afternoon, everyone. Um, this is a case of a 52 year old, uh, 52 year old female who had uh, solid uh, right nasal cavity mass and had complaints of uh, nasal obstruction and nasal discharge. So on, we received three polypoidal tissue bits and the largest bit was measuring around 3 into 1.5 into 1 centimeter. On cut surface, there was whitish to brownish areas noted. So coming to the microscopy, On microscopy, we can see tissue fragment lined by uh, respiratory epithelium and uh, the sub epithelium is showing uh, tumor cells which are arranged in uh, nests and sheets and these tumor cells, uh, as you can see, are round to polygonal and uh, occasional uh, uh, prominent nucleoli is seen. Um, so you can see increased vasculature and a uh, few areas of uh, hemorrhage and uh, bone mature bone fragment is also seen. So we received uh, various responses. So the majority of the responses what we received was um, olfactory neuroblastoma followed by uh, nasopharyngeal carcinoma and uh, biphenotypic nasocinal sarcoma and uh, sinonasal undifferentiated uh, carcinoma. So our differential diagnosis was, uh, we had two differentials, that was uh, sinonasal undifferentiated carcinoma and uh, sinonasal uh, melanoma. So we went ahead and did IHC on this case. The first marker which we used was HMB45, which turned out to be positive. So next we proceeded with uh, Melan A, which also turned out to be positive and uh, cytokeratin uh, was done, which was negative. So since HMB45 and Melan A was positive uh, it was, and uh, cytokeratin was negative, uh, our final diagnosis was given as uh, malignant uh, mucosal melanoma. So coming to the discussion part, uh, it's a mal uh, malignant tumor which arises from the neural crest originating from the pigment cells that is melanocytes, which demonstrates the melanocytic differentiation and also mostly arises from the cutaneous origin. 
So the incident, uh, this mucosal melanoma is very rare and behave aggressively. And uh, around 15 to 20% of these melanomas arise in the head and neck. And, uh, uh, and most common site is uh, sinonasal tract, most commonly in the anterior nasal uh, uh, septum. So coming to the differential diagnosis, which most of the uh, pre uh, presenters gave, uh, olfactory neuroblastoma was one of the most commonest uh, response we got. Uh, in olfactory neuroblastoma, what we see is the uh, monotomous tumor cells along with the uh, homorite rosettes, which we are not seeing the present case. And in the uh, olfactory neuroblastoma, CD56 and chromogranin and cyanotrophicin is positive. And uh, 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 the second most response what we received was sinonasal undifferentiated carcinoma. Even we were go, uh, uh, thinking in terms of sinonasal undifferentiated carcinoma. But when we did cytokeratin uh, in the present case, it came, uh, turned out to be uh, negative. So uh, in sinonasal undifferentiated carcinomas, uh, uh, keratin ca turns out to be positive. So because, uh, and these were the other uh, responses. And the third most common response which we received was uh, biphenotypic sinonasal sarcoma. Here, microscopically, we're seeing uh, proliferation of spindle cells, a lot of malignant spindle cells, and it is uh, uh, positive for S100 and SMA. So because we had our IHC uh, findings uh, were uh, positive for HMP45 and um, for uh, melan A and cytokeratin was uh, negative, our final diagnosis uh, turned out to be mucosal malignant uh, melanoma, which is very rare and it was never documented any. So these were our references. Thank you, Dr. Bhavna, for the presentation. Any questions? So uh, now we'll move on to spotter number four. Uh, spotter number four is that of a 30 year old female with a left nasal mass. And this is a microscopic picture of that uh, left nasal mass. Any guesses? 30 seconds for your guesses. We'll provide slightly more time than 30 seconds because there seems to be lag between our interaction and the YouTube link. Okay. 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 Okay, so we have a response from Dr. Nandini, rhinosporidiasis. Dr. Lakshmi, rhinosporidiasis. A whole lot of rhinosporidiasis. Can you name the out. organism and the nature of this organism? Okay. Okay. Yeah, what is the nature of this organism? Name of this organism? The Dr. Nandini says sea berry. Yes. Uh, the entire name, please. Yeah. Yes. So we have received several responses uh, saying it is Rhinosporidium seabiri, which is the right diagnosis. The nature of this organism, it's uh, uh, neither a fungus. It usually be, it was called as a fungus. Uh, it's no longer uh, uh, thought of as a fungus. It's a protistan uh, uh, organism, which uh, is at a divergence between uh, animal and fungus. So they call it a protistan organism, parasitic organism. Thank you for your responses. Thank you. Uh, now we move on to case number five, uh, by uh, presented by Dr. Raj Shekhar Aparna from SS Institute of Medical Sciences, Davangere. Over to Dr. Raj Shekhar Aparna. Yes, sir. So the slide is visible, sir. Yes, please go ahead. Make it full screen, please. Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. I am a postgraduate student from SSIMS RC Davangiri. It is my privilege to present a slide in KCIPM slide seminar. I'm going to present case number five. A 46 years old male with polyosteotic expansor osteolytic lesion with a history of multiple bone pain since three months with pathological fracture of patella. USG neck showed enlarged right parathyroid 
and hemithyroidectomy was done. A scanner view showing multiple expands and nodules separated by the thick fibrous septae, few areas were capsulated, cystic change and hemorrhagic areas were seen. This is a thick fibrous capsule and broad fibrous septae dividing the multiple expands and nodules. The cells were arranged in the solid sheets, trabecular pattern, follicular pattern, and zell valent pattern. The cells were polygonal with eosinophilic cytoplasm and the nucleus were round over. Few di discrete oxophilic cells were seen and few cells showed clear cytoplasm. In hyperbar view, we were able to appreciate macronucleoli. The nucleus were arranged towards the vascular septa, which is known as regimentation, one of the features for parathyroid neoplasm. This is a normal parathyroid parenchyma and uh, the uh, parathyroid neoplasm, which is separated by the uh, fibrovascular septa. Few areas of this showed diffuse uh, tumor cells arranged in follicles, and few areas showed hyperchromatic polymorphic nuclei with bizarre cells. In one of the sections, we were able to see the thyroid tissue with micro and macro follicles with colloid and there were no tumor invasion. With all these features, we would like to give a differential diagnosis of atypical parathyroid adenoma and as well as parathyroid carcinoma. There are, few, uh, there are definitive criteria for malignancy. One is absolute criteria, having invasion into surrounding soft tissue, invasion of su surrounding vital structures, vascular invasion, perineural invasion, and histological documented regional or distant metastasis, which was not given for us. One of the foci showed a nodule in fibrofatty tissue. However, this was not very clear in our case. So these absolute criteria were not found in the given case. The other criteria, out of which four should be there to satisfy. Uh, one uh, which we saw is broad uh, intratumoral fibrous band splitting the parenchyma and separating the expansile nodule. The diffuse sheet like monotonous small cells with high NC ratio, diffuse cellular atypia, macronucleoli present in tumor cells. With all this, uh, uh, as we were not able to see the absolute criteria, and we were able to satisfy four of the other criteria and with few clinical features suggesting towards the malignancy, we would like to give a, a diagnosis of parathyroid carcinoma. These were my references. Thank you. Now we have Dr. Ramya presenting the case. Yeah, uh, so the history given is uh, multiple bone pains since three months. Uh, the patient had fracture of ulna three months back, also a fracture of uh, patella five days back, and swelling in front of the neck since one year. So going by the history, uh, we come to a provisional, uh, maybe a conclusion that maybe it is from a parathyroid arising. Uh, the parathyroid hormone levels were 1,430. So it's uh, markedly increased and serum calcium levels were also increased. So it's 15 milligram per deciliter. The, we received a right parathyroidectomy and a right hemithyroidectomy specimen. The parathyroid was enlarged. It was 3 by 3.5 by 2 by 1 centimeter and the weight was increased. It was 5 grams. Normal weight is uh, within 5 milligrams. The external surface was congested and on cut section we are seeing uh, irregular lobular whitish to brownish areas. The thyroid was unremarkable. Uh, going to the microscopy. Uh, so we received uh, the, so we can see the parathyroid with a encapsulated tumor showing uh, the tumor cells arranged in lobules separated by this uh, broad and thin fibrous septic. Uh, going on higher power, we can see that these tumor cells, they are arranged in 
uh, as explained by Dr. Aparna, it's arranged in sheets, in lobules, and also in follicular pattern. Going higher, uh, the, these tumor cells are highly pleomorphic. And they show enlarged uh, nucleus having coarse granular uh, chromatin and also granular eosinophilic cytoplasm. Also, there are uh, the stoma shows mild lymphocytic infiltrate with areas of hemorrhage and infarction. We can see it here. Um, as we go towards the capsule, uh, the uh, criteria that were uh, told by Dr. Aparna that is uh, the invasion into the capsule. So we can see here that the tumor is uh, infiltrating into the capsule clearly and also there are multiple LVIs over here. Yeah. Also, after uh, invading into the capsule, the tumor is going into the adjacent soft tissue. Here. Here we can see the tumor is invading into the adjacent soft tissue. So out of the uh, four criteria, three of the criteria are satisfied. So the responses we have got majority uh, told it's a parathyroid carcinoma, 14. Uh, it's not a parathyroid adenoma because that is uh, lymphovascular invasion, that is capsular invasion and that is infiltration into the soft tissue. Ostitis fibrosa cystica, it's also called Brown's tumor. It is actually a clinical manifestation of uh, hyperparathyroidism and which is seen in the bones. Here we had given a parathyroid. So in this we can see that uh, in ostitis fibrosa, we are seeing, uh, we can see the osteoclasts and the fibroblastic proliferation. Parathyroidomatosis, uh, it is uh, actually uh, after the surgery, if there is a spill of the parathyroid into the soft tissues, it appears to be, uh, it appears to look like an infiltrating uh, parathyroid carcinoma, but it will not have uh, lymphovascular invasion or uh, uh, capsular invasion, so to call it uh, parathyroid carcinoma. So the diagnosis is of parathyroid carcinoma. It is a very rare entity which is seen in less than 1% of the people with hyperparathyroidism. Yeah, these are my references. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rama, for the presentation. Now we'll move on to the spotter number five. Any questions? Okay, the spotter, fine. Uh, we received a spleen, a 59-year male with a spleen, splenic mass. This is the cut section of the spleen. Exactly. Yeah, uh, uh, we want the diagnosis. I think Dr. Nandini has mentioned splenic abscess. Uh, these cystic spaces which are lined by flat. Okay. Ten seconds. And the ten seconds more. A lot of responses as hydrated cyst. Yeah. Yeah, the responses are hydrated cyst, uh, splenic abscess. We are seeing multiple cystic spaces filled with this yellowish to whitish material. Uh, coming to microscopy, we are seeing uh, dilated cystic spaces lined by flattened. Uh, lining epithelium and there are also uh, lymphocytic aggregates and sheets of lymphocytes in the very what is your diagnosis? Jaideep says lymphangioma. Okay, so the diagnosis is splenic lymphangioma. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Dr. Akshay. Uh, I would like to invite Dr. Pratyusha from BLD Bijapur to present sixth case, please. Campus. 
this part. Yes, we can see your slide, Dr. Pratyusha. You can start. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Pratyusha. Uh, I'm second year postgraduate from BLDA Medical College. The case history given was 40 years female with low grade fever since. Full screen, slideshow. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, it is visible, sir. Yes, yes, sir. yes perfect. The cases, the case history given was 40 years female with low grade fever since three months, bicytopenia with left axillary lymphadenopathy and mild hepatosplenomegaly. The laboratory findings given are uh, de shows decreased RBC count, decreased hemoglobin count. Normal WBC count decreased hematocrit. NRBC is 4.7 per 100 WBCs. MCB is raised. MCH is raised. MCHC platelet count is normal. MPB is normal. Reti count is increased. Neutropenia with lymphocytosis with monocytosis is seen. Red count and retic count is raised 27.16 percent. Error is decreased and MFR is normal and HFR is increased. Red HE, RBC HE are normal. Delta HE is normal. On peripheral smear, predominantly normocytic normochromic cells are seen. Occasionally, macrocytic cells are seen. There is shift to left up to metamyelocytes, isnophilic metamyelocytes, and band forms are seen. Few monocytes are also seen. Lower magnification of bone marrow aspiration smear shows hypercellularity. Higher magnification shows many cells of myeloid series, few erythroid series, and few hyperlobated megakaryocytes. Low magnification of bone marrow biopsy shows hypocellular marrow with uh, normal trabeculae. Higher magnification shows uh, marrow infiltration with ill-defined uh, 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 granulomas comprised of epithelioid cells and lymphocytes. And also cells of myeloid series and few cells of erythroid series are seen. Also aggregates of epithelioid cells, histiocytes and with areas of fibrosis, fibrosis is noted. Along with occasional multinucleated giant cells are seen. Based on this, the probable diagnosis given is myeloctic anemia, which is due to infiltration of abnormal cells into the bone marrow and subsequent destruction and replacement of normal hepatocortic cells. And the causes can be metastatic tumor cells, tuberculosis, and fungal infections. And on bone marrow aspiration, small round to oval forms are seen. And there is a possibility of leishmaniasis or maybe an artifact. As metastatic deposits are not seen, and on bone marrow biopsy, intracellular, extracellular, small round to oval forms comprising of a nucleus and kinetoplast suggestive of LD bodies are not seen. Probable diagnosis is myeloptic anemia, secondary to granulomatous inflammation. Uh, there is a possibility of tuberculosis, and there is no necrosis. It can be sarcoidosis. Other investigations required are Jaden stain, PCRSA, CBNAT to rule out tuberculosis, antibody detection to rule out leishmaniasis. Serum biochemical tests and serum AC levels have to be done to rule out sarcoidosis. Based on the history, with fever, with hepatosplenomegaly, with axillary lymphadenopathy, possible DDs are myeloproliferative syndrome, sarcoidosis, leishmaniasis, leukemias, lymphos, lymphomas, and tuberculosis. With macrocytosis and monocytosis, it can be myelodysplastic syndrome and leishmaniasis. With bicytopenia history, it can be myelodysplastic syndrome, marrow granulomas, leishmanias, and leukemias. Thank you very much for the opportunity given. Thank you to KCAPM. Thank you, Dr. Patricia. Uh, Dr. Glenn, yes, please discuss the case from our side. Uh, just go to display settings and uh, swap displays on top. No display settings. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, good evening, one and all. Uh, Again, we can still see the presenter view. I think there's something. Please go back to display settings and just go back to display settings. Second option from top. Yes, this is fine. Please. Uh, good evening. Thank you, Pratyusha, for this uh, 
for presenting the case with this huge bunch of differentials. Okay. So the history provided to us was a 40 year old female with low grade fever since three months, by cytopenia that was low HB and WBC count, left axillary lymphadenopathy and mild uh, hepatosplenomegaly. The differentials that we received for this case <clears throat> were uh, HLH, hereditary spherocytosis, acute myelogenous leukemia, granuloma granulomatous inflammation and megaloblastic anemia. Okay. So this is, these are the images of the bone marrow aspirate. So this is to show you that it is a cellular marrow. You see the, the marrow particles and to the image to your right, you see a good cell trail that is seen where you see that there are erythroid islands. There are mega karyocytes. So towards your left, uh, if you see that is an immature megakaryocyte and towards your right, that is more of a mature but a hypolobated megakaryocyte. Apart from that, you see myeloid, you see uh, various stages of maturation in the myeloid series. And you see that there are some striking eosinophils also that are seen in this image. The higher, uh, the high, uh, the higher power view of the same, again, you see a couple of megakaryocytes that are here. Some of them are immature megakaryocytes. Again, myeloid predominant erythroid series that are seen, few lymphocytes scattered here and there. And towards your right, this is a peripheral smear image again where there are some there are some lymphocytes that are seen, some monocytes and neutrophils. So more or less it is an uh, and so the, the aspirate is more or less just a cellular aspirate. Now let us scan the marrow. Okay, so here you see that there are these two cores of Dr. fragmented Glenn, we the screen. Rakshi, that resharing of the screen, I think that is the issue. Uh, you need to share the entire screen. Glenn, just stop sharing screen and go back to share screen. Just share the entire screen. This is the entire screen. Yes, this is fine. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So here, this is the trephine biopsy where you see there are two cores which are sort of fragmented and let us start scanning them. So here you see that you see some muscle, some fibrocollagenous tissue, the lamellar bone, and then you see the marrow elements. So if you see, there are loose clusters of megakaryocytes, some hypolobated megakaryocytes, and then you see some erythroid islands that are seen and even the myeloid series. Now this is the cellular, the hematopoietic part of the marrow. And here, if you see, you can see that there is a, there is a granuloma that is seen, like, like Pratyusha rightly said, that there is a granuloma that is seen. And then here, you see that there are some clusters of histiocytes, these large cells, with centrally placed nucleus and eosinophilic cytoplasm and some lymphocytes in clusters and scattered in the interstitial. Okay. Yeah. Is the screen visible? Okay. So to summarize the findings, I put it in a particular pattern because I want to emphasize on the points that you need to put on reporting a bone marrow trephine biopsy. That is the section shows trephine biopsy, which shows fragmented two cores consisting of fibrocollagenous tissue, skeletal muscle, lamellar bone, encasing nine to 10 marrow spaces. 
Cellular, the cellularity seems hypercellular for age because the cellularity essentially is contributed both by the granulomas and the hematopoietic elements. Megakaryocytes are mature and few hypolobated forms are seen. Erythroid series, normoblastic pattern of maturation. Myeloid series also show normal maturation. Lymphocytes are seen in small aggregates and scattered throughout the interstitium. And in additional findings, some areas are completely replaced by epithelioid granulomas and histiocytes. There are few scattered large atypical cells which we found on further inspection with prominent cent central nucleoli. No blasts were seen and section for reticulin showed accentuation of reticulin fibers which were surrounding the granuloma. Otherwise, there was no increase in fibrosis. Now, this is the image which we found. Um, so I put these images. These are the cells which the large mononuclear and binucleate cells which we found on further inspection. So what these cells it what these cells could be, Pratyusha, if you could answer. Any responses? Anyone can respond, any of the PGs who are part of the uh, WebEx meet. What do these cells resemble? Okay, Glenn, I think you can proceed. Okay, so these resemble, so the binucleate cell, it looked suspicious of a reed steenberg cell, and this is more like a mononuclear Hodgkin cell. So in presence of granuloma, it does raise a suspicion if this could be a Hodgkin's lymphoma. So putting all of that together, we signed out the report has a hypercellular marrow with granulomatous inflammation with scattered large atypical cells. Possibilities considered were a my mycobacterial etiology, especially we are in India, and it is the most common cause of granulomatous inflammation, which uh, involves the marrow. And the second DD, in view of having these large atypical cells, we called, we even gave a differential diagnosis of Hodgkin's lymphoma and advised correlation with X ray, molecular, and microbiological culture studies, correlation and histomorphology from the lymph node because there was an axillary lymph lymphadenopathy and immunohistochemistry with the particular panel of CD20, CD3, CD15, 30, PAX5, and EBV LMP1. So then we next we received um the biopsy of the left axillary lymph node and if you see in the scanner view there is effacement of the lymphoid architecture as we go to low pi you see that there are some histiocytic aggregates and ill-formed granulomas that are seen in the higher in the higher power like we expected we found these mononuclear atypical cells with vesicular nucleus, central eosinophilic macronucleoli, and moderate amount of eosinophilic to amphiphilic cytoplasm in a background of mixed inflammatory infiltrate. So the report uh, in histopathology was given as a phasement of uh, lymph node architecture, polymorphous active lymphoid cells, plasma cells, and histiocytic aggregates atypical cells resembling RS cells and immunohistochemistry showed membranous and Golgi dot reactivity for CD30 and CD, CD15 and EBV LMP1 and dim nuclear reactivity to PAX5. So dim nuclear reactivity is very important, which is very smudgy and light, which is seen in these atypical cells, whereas bright PAX5 positivity is seen in normal B cells and it was negative for CD3 and CD20. So the final diagnosis given was classic Hodgkin lymphoma with bone marrow involvement. So uh, like Pratyusha already mentioned, she gave this huge list of um, differentials, which I was almost going to present, but yeah. So when you see a granuloma, you need to keep these particular differentials in mind, never jump to a conclusion of tuberculosis as it is common. So infective conditions like tuberculosis, toxoplasmosis, autoimmune condition like sarcoidosis, drug-induced neoplastic Hodgkin's lymphoma, NHL, and metastasis. 
And uh, points to be remembered, history very important, presence of fever, leukopenia, lymphadenopathy, hepatosplenomegaly, history of cough, any exposure to tuberculosis, clinical examination, again, presence of lymph nodes, hematological hematological indices whether there are whether there are whether there are cytopenias or if there is increase in esr the aid of serology um, like afb cb nat rhodomin oromin line probe assay midget to act, to confirm if there is a tubercular etiology and on bone marrow examination when you see a granuloma always look for eosinophils because they could give a clue or lead you towards hodgkin's disease if there is necrosis what kind of necrosis whether it is whether it is some uh, something like a caseous necrosis and presence of if there are rs cells so rs cells uh, typically are not very easily found they are usually hardly 3 to 5% which are usually formed found so you have to actively look for rs cells and atypical cells, if there is any metastasis, that has led to the formation of granulomas. And with all this in mind, immunohistochemistry is going to help you. So uh, to discuss a little about the differential diagnosis received, so definitely this was a granulomatous inflammation. Yes, and uh, since we found uh, since we found that there were these um, Reed Steinberg cells, so we suspected Hodgkin's lymphoma. Now, myelopathic uh, anemia secondary to granulomatous inflammation. So here, if you see the marrow was hypercellular, there was no increase in fibrosis. So this was just a granulomatous inflammation which had granulomas. It was not myelopathic. HLH obviously so the serological, the biochemical parameters, clinical history um, did did not point towards HLH per se. But yes, and it's when we did not even find any evidence of uh, hemophagocytosis in the marrow. Acute myelogenous leukemia usually does present with pancytopenia, but we, did, we have seen cases where platelets could be normal. However, the marrow did not show any blasts and there was no suppression of trilineage hematopoiesis. Megaloblastic anemia, the history had fever, lymphadenopathy. So, some amount of megaloblastoid chains can be seen in inflammatory conditions. So megaloblastic anemia is not a differential and hereditary spirocytosis. Uh, I think this was probably given based on the hematological parameters that we had given, but that was to show you that there was a component of autoimmune hemolytic anemia. So always look for RS cells is something which I would recommend. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Glenn. And I have Dr. Pradeep to take the next quarter and the next case, please. Yeah. Is it visible? Uh, again, I think yes, we are able to see the present of you, Pradeep. Okay, one minute. Uh, yeah, the whole of Glenn's presentation could see only present of you. I'll just go to slideshow on top. Slideshow next to animations. Okay, here. Yeah. Go to slideshow. Uh, yeah. Uncheck present of view. Yes. The last one. Last checkbox. Next to that. Yeah. Just uncheck that. Yeah. Okay. Now try presenting. Yeah, that's great. Please proceed. Okay, so this part is six. So the history is, it's three uh, patients who have ictus and splenomegaly, MCB low, MCH low, and there is anemia. With this and this morphology, what's the next investigation you want to ask? That's the first part of the question. Okay, I can see so part of the WebEx meeting have a good opportunity to beat the others with the answer. So please actively participate because I think answers will start coming in on YouTube now. Okay, people have told it's retic. Any other investigation next? Okay, now what's the diagnosis? 
poor answer, Gretik. That's right because to look for a golf ball inclusions. Okay, someone answered electrophoresis. Now, can we get to the diagnosis? I think the YouTube is still showing a smear. The the graph has not yet come up. Just give a few seconds. Yeah, now the graph and the image have come up. You will start getting responses now. Yes. Yeah. HPH is one response. Any more? Yeah, it's HPH yeah. disease. Yeah. Right. Okay, and just all of you just have a look at that uh, RBC histogram. It's very typical of a thalassemia intermediate. Okay, that's it. So in more to case number seven, which will be presented from JSS. Dr. Gauri will be presenting case 7A. Yes, sir. Yeah. If you can stop, stop sharing your screen. Yeah. So that they'll share. Yeah. Uh, PPT is visible, sir. Yes, yes. 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 Go ahead. Just click the lower rightmost button. Yes, that's the one. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Gauri Dagich. I'll be presenting case 7A. History providers was 15 year old girl with icterus and splenomegaly. So this was the cell counter data that has been provided, which is showing RBC as normal hemoglobin slightly decreased with decrease in HCT, MCV, MCH and a slight decrease in MCHC. Retic and RDW is increased with WBC showing upper limit of normal platelet is adequate. Now we'll move to the RBC histogram, which is showing a broad base. Broad base usually depicts that in isocytosis is present. Just before the main graph, we can see a small peak. This small peak can be due to the microcytes or the presence of fragmented RBCs. Similar findings can be confirmed on the platelet histogram. This was the peripheral smear that has been provided to us. In this, we can see predominantly the cells are normocytic normochromic with many cells showing microspherocytes, ellipticides, and polychromatophils. The one thing that we have to note here is these microspherocytes are of uniform size. There is no variation in the size of these cells. This is the next image, which is showing microspherocytes and polychromatophils. This is the hemoglobin electrophoresis that has been provided, which is showing a mild decrease in the HbA, that is 95.2, with a mild increase in HbF and HbA2. So, I'm summarizing my findings. According to the CBC, RBC is normal in number, with decrease in hemoglobin and RBC indices, and increase in RDW and retic percent. WBC is showing the upper limit of normal with platelet being adequate. Peripheral smear findings, it is a normocytic normochromic, n isopoeculocytosis, and significant number of spherocytes were also present. We can also see polychromatophils. Keeping in mind the history, the history provided was a 15-year-old girl with icterus and splenomegaly. Then we uh, went to the CBC count, uh, counter that was showing a significant increase in RDW and retic percentage. Then we correlated with the peripheral smear, which was uh, showing a significant number of spherocytes, which were of almost equal size. We can think it is a hemolytic blood picture, which is mostly suggestive of hereditary spherocytosis. To confirm my diagnosis, the next step of investigations that I would like to recommend are LDH. LDH is usually increased in all of the hemolytic blood pictures. DCT. DCT is negative in hereditary spherocytosis, but it, it helps to differentiate it from AIHA, which usually so, show DCT positive. Serum iron levels. 
I would recommend serum iron levels because iron and folate levels, they usually uh, modulate or they change the indices. And in our cases, indices are low. That's why increased bilirubin osmotic fragility test. In this, the hereditary spherocytosis will shift the curve towards the right. Incubated fragility test. In this, we'll keep the blood sample for 24 to 48 hours in the other room temperature that is 37 degrees Celsius. The most sensitive and specific test is the flow cytometry based EMA binding test. And the next is SDS PAG analysis of red cell membrane. So according to me, it should be hereditary spherocytosis. Thank you. Case 7, B will be presented now itself. Uh, yeah, we'll present case both case. cases and then uh, have the discussion together. All right, sir. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I am Dr. Divya Vogri and I'll be presenting case 7B. It is a 29-year-old pregnant female with ictris and splenomegaly. Coming to the cell counter data, the RBC count is low, hemoglobin is low, MCV is elevated, MCHC is decreased, and uh, the RDW is increased and uh, the reticulocyte percent is 11% increased. Uh, coming to the WBC, it is normal in number and platelet is adequate. So coming to the scattergram, we can see that there is an increase in the reticulocyte percent and uh, more so in the uh, reticulocyte image or reticulocyte fraction. Coming to the histogram, we can see that uh, it uh, the RBCs are predominantly normocytic, norm normocytic, normochromic, and we can see that there is an elevation on the right side indicating macro size and an elevation towards the left, uh, left side of the peak, which indicates the presence of either fragmented RBCs or microcytes. Coming to the peripheral smear, we can see that the blood picture is predominantly that of normocytic, normochromic uh, RBCs, and we can see that there is marked anisocytosis present. We can see many polychromatophils present. Along with that, plenty of spherocytes also are noted. Uh, the next image shows a lot of um, macrocytes and also macroobelocytes along with teardrop cells. So uh, coming to HB electrophoresis, we can see that there is an elevation, uh, there is a, a decrease in HPA levels, increase in the HPF and the HPA2 levels. Summarizing all the findings, the cell counter data revealed RBC to be decreased in number, hemoglobin was decreased, the RBC indices MCV is increased, MCHC is decreased, RDW is increased, and reticulocyte percentage is increased. The WBC are normal in number and platelet is adequate. Uh, coming to the RBC histogram, we see the presence of um, mostly normocytic, norm normocytic, normochromic RBCs, along with macrocytes, fragments, and my uh, or microcytes. The scattergram reveals the presence of uh, many immature reticulocyte fraction. Coming to the peripheral smear findings, the RBCs are predominantly normocytic, normochromic. Anisopoikulocytosis is present. Polychromatophils and spherocytes are also seen. Macrocytes, macroovelocytes, and teardrop cells are also noted. Platelets are adequate. And on HB electrophoresis, we saw that HBA was decreased. HBF and HBA2 were increased. HBF is increased up to, a, uh, HBF up to 5% is considered normal in pregnant females. And HBA2 is also um, indicating, uh, the increase in HBA2 is indicating uh, the deficiency of uh, folate bar uh, vitamin B12. So uh, based on this uh, and uh, all the other findings, I would uh, think of a diagnosis of a hemolytic anemia, possibly nice. immune mediated, which is associated with the folic acid deficiency. Uh, knowing that the patient has splenomegaly and also icterus, I would go in for these investigations such as LDH uh, and serum bilirubin to rule out any kind of hemolytic uh, blood picture and uh, uh, to look for uh, uh, the hemolytic blood picture. Whom's test uh, to uh, direct and indirect to uh, look for immune uh, mediated hemolysis and vitamin B12 and folate levels, and to find out why uh, the, maybe the trigger factor for the immune mediated hemolytic anemia, I would look in for the ANA profile of the patient to rule out SLE. So, these findings, I would uh, this is my final impression. Hemolytic anemia, possibly immune mediated associated with folic acid deficiency. Thank you. Thank you. That was a wonderful presentation, Dr. Divya. So we'll uh, move on to.
Yeah, is the screen visible? No, it's no, not no. visible. Yes. Yeah, now it's visible. Please make it full screen. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead, please. Yeah, a wonderful presentation, both of you, particularly Dr. Divya. So coming to the first case, uh, the history was a 15 year old girl with actress and splenomegaly, and this was the cell counted data provided. So we have, uh, I have just compared the RBC histogram because we are speaking of anemias, uh, red cell histogram plays a very important role. So this is how a normal RBC histogram would look where on the left hand side, it will be very symmetrical as such, but in the present case, if you can see, it is like kindly asymmetrical and there's kind of trail which is going on. We'll just explain you what it is. And uh, these were the responses received. I'm just going by whatever questions we have asked and what are the exact answers. And these were the responses which were received. And uh, strikingly, most of them uh, called it microcytic hypochromic and reticulocytosis, yes. And then the answer what, uh, we were looking for it was the same. There is anemia, there is a reticulocytosis, there's microcytosis, but uh, the red cell histogram, it's asymmetric. There's a trail which is possibly polychromatophils. So that's in this case. Now, coming out to the smear, the main striking feature here is it's so darkly stained. So that means these are all spirocytes. And then you have these kind of mushroom kind of cells, which we call pincer cells. And the same uh, smear, again, you have few of those here. These are the pincer cells. So these were the responses received. Most of them actually picked it well, saying it's a pincer or mushroom cells with spirocytes and normocytes. And then few of them called it autoimmune hemolytic anemia, which is not so because the spirocytes are quite uniform as uh, Dr. Gauri mentioned. So these were the answers what we were looking for, which was almost there. And then, we asked the question that integrating these uh, clinical picture morphology and everything, what's the next set of investigation? And these were the uh, commonest responses we actually received asking for LFT, which is actually good because we are looking at a uh, hemolytic anemia. Direct Coombs, yes, to rule out an immune hemolytic, but pincer cells here give, give away the answer. So the answer which we were looking for is with icterus and splenomegaly being there, it is a hemolytic process. So we are thinking either it's a membrane pathology or thalassemia intermedia phenotype. But then coming on to the cell counter data and morphology, that's when we call it to be a spirocytosis. It's a red cell membrane pathology. And for that, we would require EMA dye binding by flow cytometry. So hemoglobin electrophosis, yes, in this case, because there is microcytic hypochromic indices, and when we come on to this particular electrophoresis, the upper limit of A2 in a normal population can be considered up to 3.5. And anything over 3.5, it is a thalassemia minor, beta thalassemia minor. So coming to that, few of them actually told there is an increased fetal hemoglobin. Fetal hemoglobin can be normal up to 2%. And in sometimes you can consider 4 also as up to normal. So Increased fetal hemoglobin, we would not consider that, but beta thalassemia trait, yes. So this was the answer we were looking for. So when we asked to summarize the findings, we were looking for an integrated response because there are, there are spirocytes on the smear and there is elevated A2. So which means there are two components and one of them actually responded correctly. That is hereditary spirocytosis with beta thal minor. So whenever you have a uh, Icterus and splenomegaly, it means there is a hemolytic process, there's no doubt. And here, there are two components. Thal minor is actually keep, will keep any person asymptomatic, but here it's the spirocytosis which is giving on to such uh, icterus and splenomegaly, the hemolytic process. And then when we come on to 7B, which is a very similar case, it's when you look at uh, the clinical data, it's same. It's icterus and splenomegaly again. So we are looking at another hemolytic anemia. 
So again, when we consider the histogram, it's quite evident here. So here you have this trail and you have a bulge right away, like this almost in the range of uh, 160, 180 femtoliter, which means there are clumping of uh, RBCs if you actually carefully look for. So <clears throat> these were the responses received and a few of them called it AHA with uh, like, and one of them told that histogram is widened, so as of macrocytes, but probably it's more towards a immune hemolytic process. So as per the cell counter data, Yes, it's anemia, reticulocytosis, and macrocytosis. And in RBC histogram, there's a trail, but here there may be polychromatophils, yes, and also possible agglutinated RBCs. So this is just to compare the previous case of HS. The trail is not as wide as you as you can see in a immune hemolytic process. And this is very classical in a immune hemolytic anemia. And this is almost very classical again in spirocytosis. If you start looking at the histograms right away. So this was a smear and as you can see a lot of macrocytes are there and spirocytes which are of varying sizes and there are some teardrop cells. And these were the uh, responses that were received. But we are looking for again yes spirocytes of varying sizes which is more towards immune hemolytic anemia. And there are polychromatophils and the num like uh, further investigations when we asked for they were few of them who told Coombs test to rule out autoimmune hum immune diseases. That's absolutely right. And yes, osmotic fragility, if it's negative, then we go for a uh, immune hemolytic process. So again, coming to the uh, answer, when we see any patient with ictus and splenomegaly, yes, it's an immune hemolytic anemia, but with the cell counter data being there, we suspect probably there is an immune mediated process or possibly a thal intermedia phenotype because of splenomegaly. But when we integrate everything, we would want to know direct Coombs test and then a hemoglobin electrophoresis to rule out a thalassemia intermedia phenotype. We'll just come to that. And yes, to screen for ANA because she's a young female. We went ahead and did a DCT for this. It was completely a very strong positive. And coming to the electrophoresis, there is 4.4, that A2 is elevated. We never uh, look as A to be decreased. We always consider A to be A2 to be the most uh, determining factor. And here F is just uh, near normal. Usually, if at all, this was a thalassemia intermedia still, we would have found more of poikilocytosis. But then this was the uh, responses that were received. Few of them told increased HPF. So we were just looking for an elevated A2 to be the thing. Now, considering these, when you asked to summarize, again, there were few uh, responses which said hereditary spirocytosis, which is not, because we are looking at spirocytes of varying sizes. And few of them told it's thalassemia trait, then thalassemia major. But there was one response which said uh, dimorphic anemia with thal trait. But there is another DD of autoimmune hemolytic anemia. That's right. So. In this particular case, there are two components. One is an immune hemolytic anemia. As you can see, DCT was positive, and that might be a cause for splenomegaly in this case. And then there is an elevated A2 component, which is which signifies that it's a heterozygous component of beta thal. But then, if at all, like we followed up this case, and the hematologist just told us uh, that if the splenomegaly we will consider this to be immune mediated and once if that does not the treatment does not get the spleen down we consider this to be a thal intermedia phenotype so that's the thing any questions on this so the take home message is whenever uh, you are requested for uh, uh, clinician request for uh, electrophoresis don't see only the electrophoresis pattern it you have to see the entire smear as a whole and cell counter data has a lot inputs for your diagnosis. Any questions? Can we move on to the spotter? I think we'll skip the last spotter. We'll okay. The next, uh, because we're running short of time. Okay, so I'll hand it over to Yes, yes, thank you.
Uh, can we have Dr. Sneha and Dr. Saira from BMC to present case number eight, please? Pradeep, you can show, stop sharing the screen. Yeah. Yeah. Dr. Sneha or Dr. Saida? Could you please unmute yourself so that we know that you're here? Okay. Yes. Please proceed. Are you able to see me, sir? Yes, we can see the screen now. Please proceed. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Shazia from Bangalore Medical College. I'm very grateful for this opportunity. I'm presenting case, case 8A. This is the CBC data provided. And uh, a 70-year-old female presented with leukocytosis due to absolute lymphocytosis of 120 into 10 to the power of 3 per microliter and relative lymphocytosis of 24.7%. Immature granulocyte of less than 1% is noted. Here, there is no hepatosplenomegaly. She also presented with anemia and thrombocytopenia. Macrocytosis is noted. No NRBCs and normal RDW. Here, MCV is increased. So, uh, I would like to, uh, MCV is increased, but it appears normal on the RBC graph. So, I would like to perform, uh, I would like to look for agglutination on peripheral smear. And I would like to perform Coombs test. The scatter plot showed a dominant and elongated lymphocyte cluster with an extension of lymphocyte population into monocyte population, leading to indistinct separation between the two cell population, triggering the blast flag. This is the peripheral sphere provided. Here we can see mature appearing small lymphocytes with characteristic condensed saucer ball pattern chromatin and scanned cytoplasm. Also, we are seeing pro-lymphocytes, which are medium-sized lymphoid cells with a round nucleus, moderately condensed to nuclear chromatin, and a prominent central nucleolus, and relatively small amount of basophilic cytoplasm. This is another peripheral smear provided. Here we can see significant number of smudge cells are noted. Uh, the presence of smudge cells is a good prognosis as it responds good to chemotherapy. Based upon the clinical findings, based upon the clinical findings, CBC data and peripheral smear, I would like to consider the possibility of chronic lymphocytic leukemia and atypical chronic lymphocytic leukemia. So when the pro-lymphocyte count is less than 15%, it indicates towards CLL. And when the pro-lymphocyte count is less than 55%, uh, it is a typical CLL. And when it is more than 55%, it is pro-lymphocytic leukemia. Uh, absolute, lymph uh, absolute lymphocyte count of more than or equal to 5 into 10 to the power of 9 per microliter, that is monoclonal B cells, is seen in CLL. This can also be seen in viral infections too, but it will be polyclonal lymphocytosis. In this case, we are seeing anemia and thrombocytopenia. And anemia and thrombocytopenia develop when the bone marrow is replaced by the leukemic cells. Autoimmune cytopenias, particularly autoimmune hemolytic anemia and immune thrombos uh, in, uh, ITP is seen in up to 25% of CLL. Autoimmune cytopenias correlates with more aggressive disease. Okay. Now, uh, immunophen immunophenotyping is required to confirm the diagnosis of CLL. So, uh, whenever there is a small lymphoid neoplasm, I would uh, first I would do uh, B cell markers, mature B cell markers, that is CD19 and CD20. Uh, uh, if it is positive, it is B cell lymphoma, and if it is negative, then it means T cell lymphomas. Then we uh, then I would do CD5. If it is positive, then uh, CD5, which is a uh, pre-germinal center marker. So, uh, I, there are two possibilities, that is CLL bar SLL or mantle cell lymphoma. 
then I will do uh, CD23, which is positive in CLL and negative in mantle cell lymphoma. The next marker is cyclin D1, which is negative in CLL and positive in mantle cell lymphoma. Then a CD200 is positive in CLL and negative in mantle cell lymphoma. This is particularly useful in a typical mantle cell lymphoma where uh, CD23 is positive. And this all this and uh, a few atypical mantle cell lymphomas will have cyclin D1 pos cyclin D1 positivity. In that cases, SOX11 will be positive and helpful. And when CD5 is negative, there are two possibilities. Uh, Dr. Shazia, if I may interrupt, could you please restrict your discussion to the case at hand? Yes, sir. I, I think we are going more into theory and approach to lymphomas. Just, just discuss the case that was given to you, please. Okay, sir. Thank you. This is the flow cytometry images. Here we can see in the first uh, image, there is a decreased forward scatter, then decreased side scatter. And uh, CD45 is positive. CD19 is positive. CD5 is positive and CD10 is negative. CD20 is positive and CD38 is negative. Then kappa chain restriction is seen. CD19 and CD40, CD19 is positive and CD43 is positive. CD23 is positive and CD200 is positive. CD19 and CD49D is positive. There's a decreased forward scatter and decreased side scatter. CD45 is positive and CD, CD7 and CD3 are negative. And here CD8 and CD4 are negative and CD5 positive and CD7 negative. This diagram we are seeing CD56 negative, CD7 negative, and C, uh, the second image shows CD56 negativity and CD5 positive. The third image shows CD2 and CD3 negative. Fourth image shows CD7 and CD1A negative. To conclude, CD45, it is a hematopoietic uh, CD45, CD19, CD20, CD5, CD43, 23, 200, 49D are positive. CD45, which is a hemato hematopoietic marker. CD19, 20 is a mature B cell marker. CD5 and CD23 are P germinal center markers. And CD200 is positive in uh, CD200 is positive in CLL. And CD10, CD38, CD3, 4, 8, 7, 2, 56, 1A is negative. So my diagnosis, uh, I would like to consider the possibility of chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Then uh, further, I would uh, I would like to assess the risk assessment. I would like to do risk assessment uh, by performing a fluorescent in situ hybridization and IgHV mutation status. If uh, there is a mutated IgHV trisomy 12 13 Q deletion, it indicates lower risk. And unmutated IgHV, uh, which which is seen by CD and ZAS and 11Q uh, deletion, 17P deletion shows higher risk. So in this case, there was CD30, CD38 was negative. So it has a lower risk. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, can we have a quick presentation of case 8B as well? Uh, please be brief and just highlight uh, your findings and your approach to the case. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Myself, Dr. Sneha, presenting case 8B from uh, Bangalore Medical College. Here, the history provided is 67 years old gentleman with absolute lymphocytosis and multiple enlarged lymph nodes without hepatosplenum megaly. The provided Coulter data shows uh, normal RBC, normal HP with normal uh, red blood cell indices, whereas WBC showing leukocytosis along with absolute lymphocytosis, monocytosis, and eosinophilia. The scatter plot also shows increase in monocytes and lymphocyte scatters, along with presence of blast and ab uh, abnormal lymphocytes. The peripheral uh, blood smear shows uh, large cells with irregular nuclear counters, dispersed chromatin, and uh, basophilic staining a uh, moderate amount of cytoplasm, with some of them shows a uh, single prominent nucleoli, 
few cells are intermediate sized with condensed chromatin and abundant basophilic cytoplasm i like to consider as uh, atypical lymphocytes flow cytometry images here the red uh, cell of interest of colored orange forward uh, scatter gram showing a population of interest showing decreased uh, forward scatter and side scatter plot also shows a population of interest with a decreased sky side scatter cd45 is positive cd19 is positive cd5 is positive and cd10 is negative second one shows a cd20 positive and cd38 dim positive uh, third one shows a, a lambda restriction with the cd19 and cd43 positive on fourth scatter, fourth scatter plot here first one is showing cd20 negative cd23 dim positive cd19 positive and cd49 positive the second flow cytometry images here the cell of interest is red forward scatter plot shows the population of interest showing decreased forward scatter uh, decreased to forward scatter and side scatter also shows decreased sc side scatter. Uh, CD45 is positive, CD19 is positive. CD19 positive with CD103 negative. Second one shows CD19 positive with CD123 negative. Third one shows CD19 positive with CD25 negative. Fourth one shows CD19 positive and CD11C negative. To summarize the above findings, positive markers are CD45, CD19, CD20, CD5, CD43 and CD49. Dim positivity is shown by CD23 and CD38. Negative is shown by CD10, 200, 103, 123, 25 and 11C. Uh, along, along with considering the provided history that is old age men with multiple enlarged lymph nodes and no hepatosplenum megaly with abnormal blastoid type of lymphocytes i would like to give my diagnosis of blastoid mantle cell lymphoma and to do additional test of cyclin d1 and sox 11 where cyclin d1 will be positive in more than 95 percent of uh, mantle cell lymphoma whereas sox 11 is more sensitive and it is more positive uh, in uh, more than 90% of mantle cell lymphoma, including uh, cyclin D1 uh, negative cases and blastoid cases. And, all, and I would also like to apply FISH to look for translocation 11 and 40, 14, which. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, are you done? Yes, sir. I'm done. Okay. Uh, please stop sharing your screen. I hope my screen is visible. Yes, it is. Thank you. Okay, sure. I'll just quickly go through uh, both the cases. Thank you, both of you, for presenting it very well. Uh, I've just noted on a couple of points that I wanted to discuss with both of you. So the first case, this was a 74-year-old lady with absolute lymphocytosis and no hepatosplenomegaly. These were the responses that we received. Uh, so most of you called it chronic lymphocytic leukemia, CLL bar, PLL, and so on. Uh, one person had given the complete diagnosis, which was CLL dry stage 3. Uh, th that was good. Uh, I've, I did get one response called chronic lymphoblastic leukemia. Uh, just so you know, there's no entity called chronic lymphoblastic leukemia. Uh, I just wanted to highlight, I think the presenter also said uh, that there was one cell which look or some cells which look like pro-lymphocytes. Just for all of you to know, this on the right is what a pro-lymphocyte looks like. It's a very distinct morphology that once when you see it, you don't forget, right? It's a very prominent central or almost slightly eccentric nucleolus with a good amount of cytoplasm. This, I, I presume this is the cell that was thought of to be a pro-lymphocyte. The chromatin is still very different when you compare it to a pro-lymphocyte. Just remember these images. So this is not a pro-lymphocytic leukemia. And coming to uh, the flow cytometry, I think the presenter mentioned that it was kappa restricted. No, it is lambda restricted because there is a lambda positive, kappa negative pattern. CD23 is strongly positive. 
49D was thought of to be positive, but uh, let me tell you, just whenever you're interpreting flow, you should also look at the distribution of the plot. This is very bottom heavy. So this is a 49D negative. There is some amount of spillover into positive, but you consider this to be 49D negative. Okay, 43 is almost moderate to strong positive. So putting all these together, this is a B cell CLN rise stage three. It's important to specify B cell because there is also a T cell chronic lymphocytic leukemia or a T cell pro lymphocytic leukemia. The additional investigations, as was rightly explained, is fish, uh, serum free light chains, and beta two microglobulins for prognostication and IGHV mutation status by sequencing. So uh, that was a good diagnosis. This is the second case, a 67 year old gentleman with absolute lymphocytosis, multiple enlarged groups of lymph nodes and no hepatosplenomegaly. These are all the responses that were received till I think around 9 a.m. today morning. I'll just take you through all of these. This was the morphology that was shown. Like you rightly said, they looked like atypical lymphocytes, query blasts. Some of them we couldn't uh, swear that they were not blasts, but they do not look like any cells that you get in CMML or CML, they don't look like pro-lymphocytes like I showed you before. They also don't look like pro-myelocytes. So I'm ruling out these three diagnoses here itself. On the flow, you have CD19 positive. Now CD20 is also positive. CD5 shows a dim heterogeneous expression. 200 is negative, okay? And lambda restricted. Just to compare the previous case with you to show a few subtle changes. CD20 in the previous case, though it was positive, was weak to moderate, right? That is what we expect in a CLL. But in this case, the 20 is bright. Just see the relative position of the 20 of the cells on CD20. The CD20 is very bright. Second thing is CD200 is negative. 200 is a very specific mark of a CLL that was negative here. And CD49D, just see the difference. This is bottom heavy. This is slightly top heavy. So 49D was positive here. Okay, 10 was negative, 38 was also negative. So, because 200 is negative, I'm ruling out CLL. I'm ruling out pre-B ALL also because a surface light chain expression is there and 19 is positive, 20 is bright, 45 is bright, right? Pro-lymphocytic uh, and AML M4 is also ruled out. Then coming to the markers for hairy cell, uh, hairy cell is defined by commonly a 5 negative, 10 negative phenotype with co expression of 103, 123, 25, and 11C. All four markers are negative in this case. So, hairy cell is ruled out. Now, we are left with an entity called, uh, I presume this is leukemic non nodal mantle cell lymphoma, very rare entity, monoclonal B lymphocytosis, and atypical CLN. Monoclonal B lymphocytosis uh, is defined by the presence of clonal B population in the peripheral blood with fewer than 5,000 cells. That this case, I agree, it satisfies that criteria, but there should also be no other signs of a lymph proliferative disorder. This person has multiple enlarged groups of lymph nodes, so it's very unlikely to be a MBL. A leukemic non nodal mantle cell lymphoma is a very rare disease with involvement of peripheral blood, bone marrow, or spleen, but without lymph node disease. Again, here he has lymph nodes. So I'm ruling out those two. We're left with atypical CLN. So the differential diagnosis that we considered were mantle cell lymphoma and atypical CLN. Uh, there are groups of researchers that consider these two to be uh, to be a, a continuum of this, uh, a, a, the same spectrum rather than two distinct disease entities. So what we signed this out as was rightly a CD5 positive B cell lymphoma, a lymphoproliferative neoplasm with these two differentials. We recommended FISH for cyclin D1 and correlations with lymph node biopsy for uh, AI67. The karyotyping showed a T1114, as was rightly shown by Dr. Sneha. And the fish was positive for a cyclin D1 IGH fusion. So this completes the diagnosis that it is a mantle cell lymphoma. So the reason why we shared these two cases was just to drive home the point that not all CLPDs are CLL. Mantle cell is in fact the second most common uh, lymphoproliferative disorder that spills over into peripheral blood in the elderly. Morphology of mantle cell is distinct. It doesn't look like CLN. So uh, you need to be aware of that. And be aware of the approach to lymphomas, which was also explained by Dr. Shazia in the beginning. So I'll stop my sharing for now. Stop, stop sharing, yes. Any uh, queries?
at this point from any of the participants? Okay, if there are no queries, I think uh, we are done with the uh, slides seminar part of today's program. The scores are being tabulated. We let you know who's the winner. All of you are winners, but on paper, who's the winner a little later. I think I'll, I, I'll invite Dr. Swati to uh, deliver her lecture. If uh, Dr. Swati, are you around? Yes. Dr. Swati is a pathologist here at uh, Newburg Anand Reference Laboratory. Her uh, areas of interest are hematopathology and uh, immunopathology. And she'll be delivering a talk uh, to tell you about ANA patterns and reporting. Yeah, Dr. Just give us a minute. Rakshit. Is my screen visible? Uh, not yet, Swati. Yep. I think the left hand, the leftmost option is the entire screen. If you just uh, use that, it may come. Once you click on share screen. Just give us a minute. I cannot hear what you said. Some other device. Is my screen visible? Is my screen visible? Not yet. Uh, sorry. Just tap on the share button and double click on either screen no one option. It says screen one. You can just, ah, yes, I think it's coming up now. Doesn't seem to have come up yet. I think the application is being, the PowerPoint is being shared. Dr. Akshit, please uh, share the presentation on, uh, share the entire screen itself. Sorry, I couldn't hear what was being spoken earlier. Uh, just, just stop sharing the screen and uh, try re-sharing re re it again. I think we okay. can't see the screen. Just click on share and just click on screen one. Double tap on screen. So yes, screen yes, perfect. Please put it to a slideshow and start. Yes. Okay. Great. Please go ahead. Yes. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Dr. Swati Kulkarni. I will be speaking about ANA patterns by indirect immunofluorescence today. The plan is to briefly talk about autoimmunity and what autoimmune disease means, and mainly talk about ANAs, uh, screening by indirect immunofluorescence, HEP2 cells, patterns and clinical relevance, and again, briefly talk about confirmatory tests using ANA. 
So autoimmunity and autoimmune disease. Uh, the difference between the two is that the essential feature of an autoimmune disease is that tissue injury is caused by the immunologic reaction of the organism against its own tissues. Autoimmunity, on the other hand, refers merely to the presence of antibodies or T lymphocytes that react with the cell antigens and does not necessarily imply the self reactivity has pathogenic consequences. So, for uh, for us to call something as autoimmune disease, tissue injury has to be there and not just the antigen antibody reaction. Uh, so, this is what autoimmunity does. Antinuclear antibodies are important elements in the diagnosis of a variety of autoimmune diseases, especially ANA associated rheumatological disorders. And ANA testing can be of screening, uh, it, it's divided into screening and confirmatory tests. Under screening, we do ANA by indirect immunofluorescence, and ANA screening is also done by ELISA or CLIA. And confirmatory tests are done by ANA plot, also known as ANA profile or line immunoassay and by monospecific allies. So right now I will be talking about ANA by indirect immunofluorescence. Immunofluorescence techniques were first used to demonstrate anti-nuclear antibodies in 1957. Earlier rodent and primate tissues were used as substrates. Over the last 40 years, human epithelial cells, also known as HEP2 cells, have largely replaced the use of rodent tissues. HEP2 cells originally considered to originate from a human laryngeal carcinoma, but later it was known that HEP2 cells are indeed established from a HeLa cell contamination. So this is how HEP2 cells look like. Uh, this is without the fluorescent image. So this is uh, before the reaction occurs. The HEP2 cells are grown as monolayers on microscope slides. These slides provide following advantages over rodent or primate tissues. So HEP2 cells are a more sensitive substrate that allows identification of many patterns. Human origin of the cells ensures better specificity than animal tissues. Nuclei are much larger, so complex nuclear details can be seen and appreciated. Cell monolayer ensures that all nuclei are visible. <coughs> cell division rates are higher, so that antigens produced only in cell division are easily located, such as centromere and mitotic spindle patterns. I will be talking about the patterns later. And antigen distribution is uniform. American College of Rheumatology has concluded that HEP2 cells is the gold standard for ANA screening. ANA detection by indirect immunofluorescence has also the advantage of obtaining information on the staining pattern, which adds additional clinical value. Introduction of HEP2 cells as the substrate of ANA uh, indirect immunofluorescence has uh, has made us aware that besides nuclear patterns, so traditionally like we've been calling it as anti-nuclear antibodies, but antibodies are directed not just at the nucleus of the cell. We've got to know that the antibodies are directed towards the cytoplasmic and mitotic compartments also. So technically it is not right to call it as ANA and probably call it as anti-cellular antibodies. But since the term, since the terminology has been used since a long time, so to provide to avoid confusion, ANA has been continued. For the detection of anti-nuclear antibodies by indirect immunofluorescence, uh, we use a combination of two substrates, HEP2 cells, which I just spoke about, and also in comparison with frozen sections of primate liver. So I listed the so advantages of HEP2 cells. So why do we need primate liver along with HEP2 cells? Because one disadvantage of HEP2 cells is that it uh, provides a lot of non-specific fluorescence and sometimes it becomes difficult, especially for the untrained eye, whether uh, the fluorescence is specific or non-specific, which is if it is true positive or negative. And uh, frozen sections of primate liver helps us in that scenario. It helps us in picking up true negative cases. So they are both complementary to each other and we use HEP2 cells and primate liver for our reporting. And due to the subjective nature of ANA screening, the quality of HEP2 cells is integral to accurate and confident reporting of the results. 
So now what are HEP2 cells and how are they manufactured? So these cells are coated. So along with HEP2 cells, there are several substrates which are used in autoimmune uh, testing. Tissue sections are used such as rodent tissue and primate liver tissue and antigen dots, cultured cells and transfected cells. HEP2 cells are the cultured cells. These cells, uh, like all these substrates are coated onto the cover slips. They are fixed with acetone, cut into fragments which are called as biochips and then these fragments are glued onto the microscopic slides and we study these slides. Uh, before going ahead, I would just like to talk about few terminologies. Immunofluorescence is a technique used for light microscopy with a fluorescent microscope. Direct immunofluorescence, also known as primary immunofluorescence. Uh, there are two types of immunofluorescence, direct and indirect. Direct uses a single antibody directed against the target of interest and the single antibody is conjugated to a fluorophore, whereas indirect immunofluorescence uses two antibodies. The primary antibody is unconjugated and a secondary conjugated antibody is used which is directed at the primary antibody and that helps us in detecting the antibodies. And conjugate is nothing but a labeled antibody. Fluorescent microscope, the specimen is illuminated with the light of shorter wavelength, blue light, which is absorbed by the fluorophores, causing them to emit light of longer wavelength, which is green light. Uh, test principle in the first step, so the specific antibodies, like I mentioned earlier, so this is the HEP2 substrate containing the antigen, and this is the primary antibody from the patient serum and the secondary antibody which is conjugated with the fluorophore and is directed against the primary antibody. So in the first step, specific antibodies from the diluted patient sample. So all the autoimmune tests are done in dilutions because like I mentioned earlier, autoimmune uh, reactions might be happening in the body and unless it is present in a significant titus, it is not pathological. So it is very important for us to prove the titers in which the antibodies is present and hence these tests are always done in dilutions. So what we follow is 1 is 200 as the starting dilution and if it is positive, we do further dilutions to assess the titer. Uh, there are some labs that also follow 1 is to 40 or 1 is to 80 dilutions. So the diluted patient sample uh, antibodies present in the diluted patient sample bind to the antigens and in the next step a FITSI labeled conjugate binds to the specific antibodies from the patient sample which is the secondary antibody and by excitation with the respective wavelength the complex can be made visible at the fluorescence microscope. So in the processing of these samples we use a unique technique called as titerplane technique. The titer plane technique is nothing but using of the reagent glass tray which is present in the left side of the image, the bottom image. Uh, it's, a, it's a unique reagent tray with place with spot with fields for us to put the samples and these fields again are unique that the fields are hydrophilic while the area surrounding the fields are hydrophobic so that the samples don't run into each other. So this is the titer plane technique. The below is the tray and above are the slides with the biochips. And only when all the samples have been pipetted are the slides placed onto the reagent trays with the biochips facing downwards like you can observe in both the images below. The biochips are facing downwards because the sample is present below. So we invert the slide and keep and then that slide is placed over the titer plane. In this way, all reaction fields come into contact with the samples at the same time and the reactions uh, are started simultaneously for all the samples. This prevents deviations in the reaction intensity due to difference in the incubation time. Titerplane technology also prevents evaporation of the samples and results in optimal fluorescence images. Uh, briefly about the procedure, 30 microliters of diluted sample is added to each reaction field and the, and the biochip slides uh, corresponding to each resist are placed on the reagent tray. 
The sample is incubated for 30 minutes at room temperature. Incubation step is important because that allows the antigen antibody reaction to happen. And the biochip slides are uh, flushed with the PBS screen and then it is immersed in the PBS for five minutes. This is the wash step and 30 microliters of FITSI labeled anti-human IgG is added to each reaction field and again incubated for 30 minutes so that the reaction between the primary and the secondary antibody takes place. The slides are again rinsed using PBS and it is rinsed and immersed in the PBS for five minutes and uh, embedding medium is placed onto a cover glass and the biochip slides are put on that facing downwards onto the prepared cover glass and the slides are read with the fluorescent microscope. This is briefly about the pictorial representation of what I just explained. This is the fluorescent microscope that we have with blue LED light and the images seen are of green. Uh, the fluorescence is green. This is the slide that we use for uh, HEP2 cells for ANA testing. On each slide, there is provision for 10 patient samples to be added and the two small squares are the biochips that I was talking about. The one on the left is the ANA HEP2 cells biochip and the one on the right is the primate tissue liver biochip. So we need to study both the biochips and then give a uh, and then uh, comment on the pattern. So likewise, the I have added two images below with the left side image being of HEP2 cells and the right side image corresponding to the primate tissue liver. This is a showing homogeneous pattern. I'm going to talk about the patterns soon. We need to look at both the HEP2 cells and the primate liver. So any patterns and their uh, clinical relevance. This is the flow chart that we follow. This is international consensus on ANA patterns. Like I mentioned earlier, the patterns are divided not just into nuclear, now nuclear, cytoplasmic and mitotic. And under each of these headings, there is different types of patterns mentioned. Under nuclear, there's homogeneous, speckled, centromere, discrete nuclear dots, nucleolar, nuclear envelope, pleomorphic. And under cytoplasmic, there's fibrillar, speckled, AMA, Golgi, rods and rings. Under mitotic, there is centrosome, spindle fibers, intercellular bridge, and uh, mitotic chromosomal pattern. I will be talking about some of these patterns today. And each of these patterns are assigned a number so that there is universal reporting system. So if I call it AC1, anybody who gets the report knows what I am talking about. Uh, so uh, the cells, like I mentioned, divide into nuclear cytoplasm apparatus and the target antigens can be present either in the chromatin, in the nucleoplasm, centromere, nucleolus or nuclear membrane of the nucleus. And, uh, and, and in the cytoplasm, it can be present in the organelles. The antibodies could be targeted against the organelles, cytoskeleton or enzymes present in the cytoplasm, or it could be of mitotic apparatus. So first, nuclear compartment. Uh, this is AC1, homogeneous pattern. Homogeneous pattern corresponds to the antibodies. Uh, the target antibodies when we get this pattern is DSDNA, histones and nucleosomes. And homogeneous staining of the entire, uh, so description of the pattern, how it looks like is homogeneous staining of the entire nucleus is seen in the interface cells with strong homogeneous staining of the metaphase chromosome plate. So these are the HEP2 cells. HEP2 cells have cells present both in interface and metaphase uh, because we need to look at the mitotic compartment as well. So in this particular pattern, since the target antigens are present in the chromatin, so on the right side of this uh, field, uh, it's so there's a pictorial representation of DSDNA, what are histones and the nucleosomes. So these target antibodies are present in the uh, chromatin of the nucleus. And since it is present in the chromatin of the nucleus, even when the cell divides, so even when the cell is, so when the cell is in metaphase, the chromatin arranges itself in the center metaphasic plate chromosomal plate. So that's why we see a homogeneous uniform pattern in the interface cells 
whereas uh, in the metaphase you see uh, the metaphase chromosome plate is also stained so the one in the center is the metaphase chromosome plate which is also stained and these are the cells in interphase which shows a homogeneous uniform staining so this pattern is known as ac1 homogeneous pattern so there's another image of our case on the left side which again shows a homogeneous pattern with the positive chromosomes so the positive metaphase chromosome plate is also showing fluorescence it is a very important feature of recognizing this pattern because uh, you, uh, because later i'll show you few images of different patterns where the clinching diagnosis in separating in coming uh, in arriving at a diagnosis for homogeneous becomes the positive meta uh, metaphase uh, staining chromosome plate and in this particular pattern if you can observe there is an accentuation membrane accentuation also it's very uniform with accentuated membrane which is very typical of dsdna so homogeneous pattern can be seen in dsdna histones and nucleosomes and uh, ts so the clinical relevance of it is it is seen in patients with systemic uh, lupus erythematosus uh, sle chronic autoimmune hepatitis and juvenile idiopathic arthritis uh, one thing which i would like to highlight is that if there is homogeneous pattern doesn't invariably mean it is sle so it's very important in autoimmune disorders to correlate the clinical features as well as the ana findings and come to a conclusion together and if required confirm by follow up test depending on the clinical presentation of the patient so in this particular case if we report it as homogeneous pattern and if clinically sle is suspected it is recommended to perform a follow up test for anti dsdna antibodies alone or in combination with dsdna histone complex which are covered in ana profile so next step of uh, ana by indirect immunofluorescence is usually a uh, ana profile or a line blot assay which consists of multiple purified antigens and we get to know which specific antigen is uh, which specific antibody is positive so if clinical if sle suspected a uh, ana profile has to be asked for for confirmation and if anti dsdna comes positive uh it is indicative of there is high chances of lupus nephritis in a patient and anti dsdna antibodies are also important in monitoring the disease activity of the patient and if nucleosomes and histones are positive that is indicative of drug induced lupus whereas if chronic autoimmune hepatitis or juvenile idiopathic arthritis is suspected follow up testing is not recommended because the respective auto antigens revealing this pattern are not completely defined so there are no ways to test these antigens so that was ac1 homogeneous pattern uh, next is ac4 or 5 i have so 4 and 5 are separate 4 is fine speckled and 5 is coarse speckled but i have clubbed both of them for uh, because sometimes it's not always uh, easy to differentiate between the two so even if we are not able to differentiate between the two we should at least be able to call it nuclear speckled so hence four or five pattern this uh, particular pattern is due to antibodies against unrnp smith uh, or speckled is because of unrnp and smith and fine speckled is because of ssa ro and ssb lab in this particular pattern speckled or granular staining of nucleoplasm is noted with no staining of the chromosome plate because all these antibodies are present in the nucleoplasm and not in the chromatin structure so that's why when the cells are dividing you don't see the fluorescence in the metaphase plate in the chromosome plate uh, here so i can see one cell here with negative staining of the chromosome plate that indicates that this is a non chromatin structure present only in the nucleoplasm so this is the speckled appearance so unlike the homogeneous pattern which was showing a uniform fluorescence in speckled pattern we don't see a uniform fluorescence it's a granular and the metaphase plate is not stained so this is the speckled pattern clinical relevance is uh, when uh, rnp or smith is positive it is indicative of sle systemic sclerosis mixed connective tissue disease 
or an overlap uh, systemic sclerosis and myositis overlap syndrome and undifferentiated connective tissue disease. Uh, the two important uh, uh, clinical scenarios to be remembered are SLE and mixed connective tissue disease. U1 RNP is not specific for SLE, whereas Smith is specific for SLE. So if Smith is positive, it is highly indicative of SLE, whereas if uh, U1 RNP alone is positive, it is indicative of mixed connective tissue disease, whereas U1 RNP and Smith both are positive and if multiple antigens are positive, it is again indicative of SLE. So it has to be confirmed again by ANA profile. SSA rho SSB lab is seen in Jogren syndrome, SLE, neonatal lupus erythematosus uh, causing congenital heart block. And uh, one thing to remember about SSA rho and SSB la is that these antigens are usually uh, can be missed on indirect immunofluorescence because the sensitivity of HEP2 cells to pick up SSA rho and SSB la is, uh, la is not very great. And that's why uh, even if uh, indirect immunofluorescence is negative, but there is high clinical suspicion of it being Jogren syndrome, it has to be repeated, uh, a profile, ANA profile has to be asked for, and we need to confirm if SSA rho is truly present or not. AC3 pattern is of centromere. Uh, CNP antibodies, A, B, and C are the target uh, antibodies, are the target antigens. In this particular pattern, 40 to 80 fine speckles are stained in the nucleus of the interface uh, cells. The speckles are characteristically aligned at the chromosomal region in the mitotic cells. So again, uh, the type of fluorescence that we see, depending, uh, it depends on the uh, target antigen. So in this particular case, if centromere is the target antigen, so what is centromere? It is present in the center of the chromatids. It holds the P arms and Q arms together, and the antibody is directed against the centromere region. And we know that there are 46 chromosomes in the nucleus. And uh, since, I mean, we cannot really sit and count the dots. So that's why they have fairly given as 40 to 80 number, 80 dots. So if 40 to 80 dots, uh, because there are different patterns, there are other patterns called as multiple nuclear dots, which, uh, which where the fluorescence is seen in only, uh, I mean, we see only 6 to 20 dots or 1 to 6 dots. So to differentiate between those two, this is to imply that when you see a uh, 40 to 80, roughly these number of uh, speckles present in the nucleus, and also that, uh, and since it is present in the, since this is also a chromatin structure, so when the cells are dividing, we should be able to see a positive stained chromosome plate. So these are the cells. So these are the interface cells where uniform speckling is seen, where uniform dots are seen. And here, these are the metaphase cells. Some of these are the metaphase cells where uh, you see that uh, the metaphase uh, plate is stained. But unlike homogeneous pattern, it is not homogeneously stained. Even in, on, even in the metaphase plate, we can see the distinct dots present. So this is indicative of a centromere pattern. Clinical relevance of this particular pattern is that it is seen in limited cutaneous systemic sclerosis. And in combination with Raynaud phenomenon, this is predictive for uh, even onset of uh, limited cutaneous uh, systemic sclerosis. And it is also observed in a subset of patients with primary biliary cholangitis. AC8910 is the nucleolar pattern. Mm, the target antigens are the RNA polymerase are, so these target antigens are present in the nucleolar region of the cell. So it can be RNA polymerase 1, 2, 3, RNA poly polymerase 1, 2, and 3, fibrillarin and PMSCL nor 90. So homogeneous fluorescence in the nucleolar region. So unlike the centromere pattern where distinct numerous dots were seen, these, uh, this pattern shows large and uh, four to five dots, which are comparatively larger compared to the centromere pattern. So this is indicative of the nucleolar pattern. So this is a, a picture showing 
the nucleus. So this is a cell nucleus and the nucleolar component and fibrillarin and PMSCL is present in the nucleolus. And likewise, whenever there are autoantibodies present against these antigens, we see a nucleolar uh, fluorescence. Clinical relevance is that it is found in patients with the diffuse cutaneous systemic sclerosis and can also be seen in association with Raynaud's phenomenon and Joplin syndrome. AC11 pattern sorry, is the smooth nuclear envelope. Here the target antigens are present on the, uh, so antibodies are directed towards the antigens present in the nuclear membrane pattern. So this is the uh, pictorial representation, nuclear membrane with lamins and uh, lamin associated proteins. The antibodies are directed against those structures. And if you remember, this looks very similar to the homogeneous pattern that I mentioned that I showed earlier. And it even causes a homogeneous staining of the nucleus. But the key differential feature in both those in both the patterns is that negative staining of the chromosome plate in a smooth nuclear envelope. In homogeneous pattern, the chromosome plate stains positive, but in nuclear membrane pattern, it is not positive. So you, you can see one cell here. So we can see that the nuclear, the metaphase uh, chromosome plate is not stained. And also whenever the two cells join together, there is membrane accentuation. So this is a key in, uh, in arriving at a diagnosis of this particular pattern. And it is important to differentiate between the two because the clinical relevance of both are very different. So this is how it looks like in hep cells. This is the nuclear membrane with nuclear membrane accentuation. But then you can see that the metaphase plate is not stained. And where the two cells meet each other, the two cells are combined there is accentuation of the nuclear membrane. And in this particular case, the primate liver actually helps us in making a diagnosis because it clearly shows just a nuclear membrane. So it's just a circular nuclear membrane positivity and not the entire nucleus being positive, unlike in homogeneous pattern. Next, about cytoplasmic compartment. It is cytoplasmic fibrillar re, uh, linear, which is uh, antigens, antibodies are present against actin and typical staining shows striated actin cables spanning the long axis of the cells. So in this, the cytoplasm is showing a distinct immunofluorescence. And what we are seeing in the nucleus is a non-specific fluorescence. It doesn't really have any pattern, so it is not significant. And what we are seeing in the uh, cytoplasm is the needle-like fluorescence, which is typical of actin. Clinical relevance of this particular pattern is that it is seen in autoimmune hepatitis type 1 uh, and chronic HCV infection and celiac disease. If autoimmune hepatitis is clinically suspected, we need to confirm this by uh, testing for smooth muscle antibodies, which is again an immunofluorescence test. Cytoplasmic dense fine speckle is the AC19 and the target antigens are PL7, 12 ribosomal P proteins. This pattern, unlike the previous pattern that I showed, this pattern appears homogeneous. So earlier we spoke about nuclear homogeneous and this is about cytoplasm showing homogeneous pattern throughout the cytoplasm. We see a, a uniform cloud-like cloudy appearance of the fluorescence. Clinical relevance of this particular pattern is, uh, is seen in patients with SLE and antisynthetase syndrome. If SLE is clinically suspected, ANA profile has to be done. And if antisynthetase syndrome is suspected, myositis profile has to be done. And uh, anti-ribosomal P protein antibodies have been associated in some studies with neuropsychiatric lupus and in childhood onset SLE with autoimmune hemolytic anemia. So identifying this pattern is very important. Next is cytoplasmic reticular pattern, which is seen against anti-mitochondrial antibodies. Uh, this immunofluorescence is a coarse granular filamentous staining extending throughout the cytoplasm. So unlike actin, actin was a linear and needle-like fluorescence, but in this it is not, it, it shows uh, coarse speckled pattern of the uh, cytoplasm. So this pattern is very typical of anti-mitochondrial antibodies. 
clinical relevance is that this is uh, seen in primary biliary cholangitis can also be detected in systemic sclerosis. If PBC is clinically suspected, it is recommended to perform a follow-up test for AMA, which is again a, a indirect immunofluorescence test looking for antimitochondrial antibodies using rat kidney as substrate, or it can also be confirmed by doing a liver profile which is a line blot assay. Mitotic compartment. Uh, I have included only one pattern which is relevant clinically, which is AC26 uh, NUMA-like pattern, also known as nuclear mitotic apparatus, nuclear uh, speckled staining. So in the HEP2 cells, if you can appreciate, so there is coarse speckling of the nucleus. But along with that, uh, the chromosomes are not positive, but this is unlike the speckled pattern that we have seen in the nuclear compartment. One additional feature of this particular staining is the uh, staining of the mitotic spindles as well. Along with the nuclear speckled pattern, there is fluorescence in the mitotic compartment as well. So these are the mitotic compartment spindles being positive. And this uh, particular uh, fluorescence can be seen in uh, Jogren syndrome, SLE. It can be seen in a number of rheumatological disorders, but primarily in Jogren and SLE. And uh, the clinical relevance of this particular antibody is that uh, some studies have shown that um, these uh, Jogren and SLE patients with this antibody have less severe clinical and biological profile, suggesting that anti-NUMA antibodies may in fact constitute a good prognosis marker in both the autoimmune diseases. So this was about the screening. I have not covered all the screen, all the patterns. I have covered only some of the clinically relevant patterns and confirm it. So once the screening is done and we give autoantibodies positive in screening test, it is mandatory to confirm the antibody present by doing confirmatory tests. So uh, some of the confirmatory tests that we do are um, monospecific immunoassays like ELISA or immunoblot. And so if we can directly, so why not skip the screening part and directly go to the confirmatory test? So what is the significance of screening part? So the screening by IAF has its own advantages over specific immunoassays, which is the number of displayed purified or recombinant antigens in the confirmatory test is limited, whereas screening by indirect immunofluorescence can detect over 100 autoantibodies. When using nuclear homogenates as substrates, relevant epitopes may be altered or lost during the process of solid phase coating. Uh, which is to say that some relevant antigens might be lost and there are chances of false negatives. So sometimes it may not correlate clinically. So if you if we jump directly to a confirmatory test and that comes negative because of this drawback that uh, that particular test has, doesn't mean the test is truly negative. And in that case, screening and the typical immunofluorescence pattern helps us in making a diagnosis. So these are some of the confirmatory tests that we have. This is the, on the left is the line immunoassay where the antigens are coated in lines. There is a control band and if a particular antibody is present, the corresponding uh, region shows a linear uh, color development, which indicates that that particular antibody is positive. And then there is ELISA. So I'm not going to go into the details of this. These are micro titer wells and using an enzyme and substrate, we detect the optical density and then uh, from the optical density, concentration of the antibody is measured. And this is a quantitative test. Uh, so I will be ending my seminar with this and gratitude to, uh, I would like to express my gratitude to KCIPM for providing this opportunity to speak. Dr. Samrat Bordoloi, who is my mentor in immunopathology, Dr. Jairam and Dr. Sujay Prasad for giving me an opportunity to make mistakes and to learn. Ms. Archana CK, who is the primary technologist in our department and she is single-handedly responsible for the smooth functioning of the department. And uh, patients without whom this learning would have never been possible. Thank you. Swati, that was a wonderful.
this point? Yeah. Are there any queries from the PHEs who are on board? Any doubts that you wanted to ask Dr. Swati? If, if there are no queries, uh, we had a talk on cytogenetics that was planned to follow Dr. Swati's, but I think we've run out of time. So we'll take that at a, at a later date. Uh, Swati, you can stop sharing your screen. Okay. Aditya, any comments? Uh, nothing. Uh, thank you. Or I thank uh, the uh, faculty at Anand Diagnostics uh, for this wonderful uh, case series. Uh, Dr. Shrileka Acharya, can you take over the presentation now? Uh, yes, sir. I have the. Uh, I have the. Shall I announce it now? Dr. Vikas, you are not audible for some reason. Could you close it? Is it better now? Yeah, much better now. Yeah, no, I, I have the winners of today's slide seminar. Yes. Uh, can I announce them now? Yes, please go ahead. Please announce. Sure. Uh, so we had uh, actually a fairly wide panel of judges. Almost five of us were sitting and judging. And uh, we've come to a consensus that uh, two PGs who presented together uh, did it very well. It was a very tricky uh, set of cases, but they approached it met methodically. Uh, gave all the possible points that we could ask for, and they're very clear in their approach. So the uh, the prize will be shared by the two presenters, Dr. Gauri and Dr. Divya from JSS, who presented case seven. So congratulations to both of them. Uh, congratulations, Dr. Gauri and uh, Dr. Divya. Uh, all the participants, you'll get your best case presentation certificates, and all the other participants will also get the certificates in a couple of days to your respective email IDs. Uh, Dr. Anand Vikas uh, and Dr. An the entire team from Anand Labs and Newburgh Anand Reference Laboratory. Thank you all for this uh, great, great case, case series for this uh, case APM site seminar. Dr. Srileka, I request you to take over the session. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, I would like to thank uh, all the participants for their active participation in the in today's slide seminar. And uh, a special thanks to uh, Anand Diagnostics uh, for uh, this uh, cocktail of wonderful cases, and we learned a lot through this. Thank you, sir. Uh, congratulations to Dr. Gauri and Dr. Divya. Uh, and I would like to announce that uh, we have KCIPM uh, social media YouTube uh, channel has reached 5,000 subscribers. And uh, stay tuned with us because the next presentation is by Dr. Anita Mahadevan on 12th March. Thank you, one and all, for attending today's session. Thank you. See you soon. Thank you. With that, we'll close the meeting. Thank you all for joining us today.